Good morning. This is the New York City Board of Standards and Appeals Public Review Session for May 14, 2018. We'll begin with the special order calendar decision items. Item number one, 24708 BZ, 3454 Nostrand Avenue, Brooklyn. Okay. Um, they provided a planting plan. Um, I think there's some internal contradictions on it that need to be corrected. There's some notes that say approximately seven, well, it shows seven trees, and it describes them as dwarf pine trees spaced two feet on center, 36 inches high at time of planting. And it shows them located at the corner of the lot and near the exit of the drive through and they've actually already been installed. Um, a second note on the drawing points to all of that stippled area and describes it as, quote, typical stone, which is what you see in the photographs. But then there is another note that says that planting strips will be maintained at least four feet wide, densely planted with shrubs or trees at least four foot high. Um, and so that's also inaccurate because there are a lot of places where there is no planting strip, but the planting area is zero feet wide. Um, and we ask that the entire area be landscaped to provide a decorative screen in front of the acoustical fencing. And they aren't showing that, and they didn't install that. So um, I don't know if we need to reopen to discuss it. Photos were provided showing the dwarf pines already installed. And it looks pretty sad, I think, surrounded by stones and weeds. Um, and, um, and then they, I'm the never-ending um, surprise of providing photos to us where it shows that, in this case, the door to the trash area, trash enclosure, is off its hinges. So it's just, like, hanging there. So um, please repair that. <laughs> and um, they did test for the menu board sound um, somehow. Um, but we asked them to also test for lighting levels as requested, I mean, lighting levels, and they didn't provide us with any information or any kind of lighting diagram. It just says that the lights will be pointed away. But there are two lights, actually, that shine at the I had a lighting I spread. Yeah. You saw a lighting spread? Uh -huh. Oh, I didn't find lighting spread. OK, good. If they did it, and they did it. There were two lights that are shining like at the, at, on either side of the menu board. Yeah. Um, page Maybe four. I just the revised plans. Maybe I just didn't. Put yeah. Or not. It shows yeah. how the lights overlap and where they're the. Oh, oh, yeah, one. yeah. Sorry. Okay. I take it back. All right. Okay. So are we reopening this tomorrow, deferring well, so it? so it's really, you know, we can talk about it more, but it, what other people think about the planting, I just thought it looked kind of pathetic. Um, <laughs> so depends on what others think. And then um, they clarified the hours of operation, which maybe I'll just sure. say. So the hours of operation are the dining room is 10 a.m. to 12 a.m. Sunday to Thursday. 10 a.m. to 1 a.m. Friday and Saturday. And the drive through is 10 a.m. to 1 a.m. Sunday to Thursday. Sorry, 10 a.m. to 1 a.m. Sunday to Thursday. And 10 a.m. to 2 a.m. Friday and Saturday. Wow. Actually, there's an hour difference on, those, on the drive through. Jeez. Got it. Anybody have any comments about that or any? thoughts about the planting it's just kind of sad looking but maybe we don't care or maybe because it's you know <laughs> they're sort of like I don't know they're sort of installed there as a it almost looks like an art installation where you put the seven trees and then that's that, and then they'll die, and then we'll be back to where they were before because it's not a serious landscaping plan. It's surrounded by sh stones. So that's more like, okay, we'll do it for us, and then they'll die, and then I'll be back to stones. I think my main concern was um, the planting in the rear. Um, so in the corner, you mean? Sorry, in the corner. Um, where put anything? they do have a... I think the last photo that they had shown that there was a very nice rose bush tree. Mm -hmm. Now in front of that, they have planted um, these other pine trees, 
which hopefully will grow to the height that they should and cover it. But typically, with most of the applications, that's the kind of starting point we have seen. So I'm just hoping that it will grow to the height and create a dense enough buffer, especially for that rear, this corner portion uh, that, that abuts the residential. That's the only area that I feel needs most of the buffering, uh, because rest is in front of the commercial storefront. And uh, well, actually, these acoustical fences should are the buffering of sound. It's the right. Those things are very effective. The fence is in good shape. So this is more like prettying up the parking lot, kind of, yeah. right? So, and you know, it's true that planting adds another layer of protection against fumes, and that's if they survive. Um, but that's why it's, this is ch a challenging place for plants, mm -hmm. because really you're holding all the fumes down with the acoustical fences, right? So there's less circulation of air. I, I don't know. What, um, I'm okay with it in this with it the way it is. Yeah, because I really don't see that adding more trees is really going to add to this site and make it more beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. I kind of feel that way, too. I mean, it's sort of the damage has already been done by the project. <laughs> The fence, like we said, fence is in good condition. That's yeah. a critical and, part. And I don't know what it looks like on the residential side, but then the residential property owner can be putting up their little pickets yeah. and vines and that That's true. thing. But at least there's a sound blockade mm -hmm. and arguably a fume blockade. Uh, you know, I don't really know how that... I think it ends up keeping the fumes within because they're heavier than that air. Yeah. So... You just don't want that. So as a plant, you're challenged. Okay. So then we're okay. Move on. Mm -hmm. Continued hearing items. Item number two, eight six six four nine BZ two two hundred dash oh one forty fifth Avenue Queens. Sorry, this was administratively adjourned. Item number three, four thirteen fifty BZ six ninety one East one hundred forty ninth Street, the Bronx. Um, our last hearing on this was in January, and we set the next hearing in May to give the time to improve and plant the, park, the parking area. Photos show fencing replaced and new planting. I think the site looks much better. Um, the parking lot permit was extended for only seven months and expires in July. I, I don't understand. I don't know anything about parking permits. Are they only for a year at a time? So. Um, this was only a seven, six months actually. It was a December issuance. So why is it so limited? Um, I see on Biz that there is an Alt 2 permit that was issued just a few days ago for what's described as tank top upgrade. Um, I, I'd like the applicant to give us more information on that. The um, there is sort of very specific information in Biz. It says tank top upgrade for five existing underground storage tanks. To include replacement of existing tank sumps, risers with new piping, dispenser islands and sumps, replacement of concrete drive mats and asphalt as necessary with installation of new area lights, no change to use, egress or occupancy. Um, so this that's an alt two. We specifically asked them to file an alt one, which they didn't do, I don't see, to include the parking lot on the zoning and the parking lot as transient parking, which is a permitted use in this district, and they didn't do that. So because that's been this whole thing of either the parking lot's on the zoning lot or it's not, now it's decided it's on the zoning lot, it's part of our purview, and they need to legalize that use. Um, in mid-January, um, Tracy, our seeker officer, obtained a copy of the 2017 spill report from DEC that shows it had been closed, because um, that was a, an issue that was raised by neighbors. Um, and I just think um, there, that in our resolution, we should reference DEC's um, 
what, what I'm calling the cautionary close note as an alert to the future boards and to DOB. So the cautionary close note is, um, it says the spill was closed due to natural attenuation of residual groundwater contamination. And then it says contamina contamination, oh, sorry, remedial activities to residual groundwater contamination not cost effective considering future use of the site. Site will remain a commercial gas station. Inclusion on residual contamination cautionary close in spill closure letter. Um, site, and then it says site is not a threat to the wider community, um, according to DEC central office guidance. So I can. Send it's in the folder, yeah. It's in the folder. Okay. I can even send you my copy. If it's in the folder, it's, it's, it's good it's enough. Fine. Yeah, we'll okay. find it in the folder. Okay. All right. Any other comments on this one? It's a significant improvement. Yeah, definitely. So it's really just the issue of the alteration type one because we really need to have that as a legal use. Um, and it, this has been before us for decades and decades, right? This is the 1950s, I think. Mm -hmm. 1950 variants. So, um, and the, the board, this board was extremely confused, as were other boards, by whether or not the parking lot was included. So I think we need to see paperwork filed for the alt one to know that this is going to be, the CFO is going to be amended. Move on. Mm -hmm. Item number four, 52864BZ, 240 02 Northern Boulevard, Queens. Okay, so this is actually a compliance hearing, right? Um, and I have pages and pages of notes, so hold on. All right, so um, photos were submitted that show new fencing and planting along the street perimeters but within the property line. So there's planting that's on the outside of the fencing, which looks really good, mm -hmm. and it's still within the property lines. That's rare, actually, that we see that. Um, I, uh, the plans that were submitted this time look like the plans that were approved in 1991, I believe. Um, and there's a letter from the owner indicating that the area immediately adjacent to the residential property is being used by those neighbors as a driveway and um, it, that it's those neighbors' preference to maintain it that way as opposed to having it planted. So mm -hmm. we plant for the benefit of neighbors, so if the neighbors prefer this, then... So I'm okay with this now. I think they're in compliance. Yeah. Everybody okay? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I went to the site a few weeks ago. And just, mm -hmm. All the work has been mm -hmm. Okay. Item number five, 634-84BZ, 2501-2509 Avenue K, Brooklyn. Um, dense, dense shrubbery, which is one of the things we wanted, was shown on the drawings as requested and to the extent possible because there's like this stairway and egress on one side, um, extent possible along the property lines that are shared with residential uses. Um, we do need more than just the designation shrubs though on the drawings. We need the type of and spacing of the planting. The planting has to be a minimum height of four feet when it's planted to grow to a minimum height of six feet and to create a dense screen. They, they have to show that on the drawings. Um, they also need to indicate and call out on the plan the locations of the wrought iron fencing which is, uh, has to be a minimum of four feet high at the property lines. Their elevations show the wrought iron fencing, but their plans don't show it. Um, so then you can't, and you rely on the plans when you install fencing. Um, on elevation P13, um, uh, there's a parapet wall line that appears to be missing. Um, and that results in the bulkheads looking much higher than in P14. So um, there's kind of like this, Floating, yeah. I think what they did is they erased the parapet wall to draw the bulkhead, and then forgot to put the parapet wall back in. That was that did not look like a layer problem. Um, 
They revised the E. They, they re revised the AS was submitted on April 25th, but I didn't see sign off. Yeah, I reviewed the EAS. Um, I have a few comments regarding that it indicates there'll be new in ground disturbance, so they might need an archaeological uh, section. And it's in the Jamaica Bay watershed, so we need that more. And we also need a seeker fee, which, which resulted in a discussion with uh, us and Commissioner Shonda. I don't know go over the FAR. Yeah. Okay, just one second. You said Jamaica Bay Waterfront. Watershed. Water, watershed. And then um, archaeological section. And what was the other one? Uh, secret fee. Secret fee. For the new Okay. And what was it about? So in our discussions, it seems um, there's some clarity that we need on the FAR. First of all, um, the proposed FAR that is uh, is 0.9, um, and what is permitted is actually 0.5 FAR per section 24-111, not one FAR, as listed in the zoning chart. Oh. Um, and specifically, section 24-111 says um, uh, in an R1 and R2, in the districts indicated for any zoning lot containing community facility facility uses other than those uses for which permits are required on, through BSA um, and certain community facilities in R1 and R through districts uh, uh, per section 74902, uh, the maximum floor area ratio shall not exceed the floor area permitted for residential uses by the applicable district regulation. The applicable district regulation in this case would be the 0.5. And this isn't for those special kinds of uses no, we like look through supportive those, housing or something No, like this that. is not. Uh, so the sections are uh, that are waived are um, sections 22-21, which is the BS, um, uh, that would require BSA. Um, oh, sorry, 73-12 would require a BSA. Um, sorry, sorry, 73-12, what's that? 73-12 is the community facility used in R1, R2, R31, R3A, R3X, R41, R4A, or R4B districts. That would get a BSA waiver. This um, does not um, fall into that when we look through the section 73-12. So you're, you're saying that BSA has a special permit that allows you to increase the floor area for a community facility but in certain not, districts. Right, but this particular one does not. Okay, but they didn't in. apply for that no. because no, they were, no. you're so saying. We, right, so we don't think this should, this should, if in order for it to be built to one FAR, um, it should then come up, there is a variance that would be required. Wait, this is a variance. This, this is, is a variance. variance. This is a variance. This is an amendment of an existing variance. Right. So okay. we get granted them a variance back in the day for. But at that time, the, the, here the variance is for a height and setback, not for parking. Curve. Oh, sorry, not for FAR. What am I saying? Wait. Yeah. It, that's true. It was a front yard and a parking right. waiver it's a initially. Front yard and parking waiver, and that's what it, now we. The additional variance that would be needed would be for FAR. Well, they were also providing, I mean, it's true that they were using one FAR as their base, but they were asking for 1.1 FAR. So I believe there was already a request. Then it so went down to 0 0.89. Yeah. Then it went to point Now it's back nine, up to 0.94. 94, yeah. okay. But their initial request would have been for an increase in floor area. Right. 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 But now that the base is 0. 0.5. Okay. That's a different. Right. That's a just a much larger yep. waiver. Okay. Right. So we need them to verify. Yes. What the carefully what the applicable FAR is mm -hmm. and I mean in the realm of things it's an extremely modest project, right? It's a large lot with a it's true that the lot gets pretty much filled up by this building, right? It also needs a lot coverage waiver, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So it, that's, that's the part about getting filled up by this building. But, the, but for instance, the building has double height space, so it's not like it's two full floors, right? Um, and, and that would also affect the, I guess that's, that's tricky to say, what the secret would be. Yeah, oh, I see. 
it affects the, I thought the secret fee is based on total for area. Well, it would be the incremental difference between the permitted, right. which is 0 0.5 FAR, uh -huh. versus what is being proposed. Okay. So as built, non-complying with approval was 0 0.88. So it was built at 0.88, even though that wasn't what we approved. Um, that time, the, this text, and I was looking at the zoning resolution history, um, when the initial approval was granted, right about that time, or a little bit after that, a text change um, happened, which introduced this section, section ah. 24111, which limited the uh, community facility FAR um, 2.5. Prior to that, up to one was permitted. Right, okay. So I have a feeling the first one fell under that prior um, zoning text. Okay, so that's a, that's also a different issue, right? So the board approves an as of right floor area that was less than, I don't know what it was, but it was yeah. less than 0.89, and then they built it at 0.89 because that's, they're looking for essentially so we should then be grandfathering it up to 0.89 because we had approved it and it's the incremental difference. Well, we didn't approve it at 0.89. It says it was an as-built non-complying with approval at FAR 0.88. Um, I don't have the, oh, it was 1985 variance for 0.73 FAR. And it was built to 0.88. So, so if anything, it's grandfathered at 0.73. And then the question is, can it go up another 0.2 to the requested, mm -hmm. right? Ready? No, in just a second. Okay, let me know when you're ready. Um, do you know when the text change occurred? Um, it's a I error. have, I have ah, all okay. the backup and I'll post approval. I'll send it to you. Okay, that's right. All right. All right. Okay. Go ahead. Item number six, 21796 BZ, 16501 Northern Boulevard, Queens. Okay, we received, um, we hadn't gotten community board com comments up before, so we received the community board conditional recommendation to approve. Um, the recommendation condition is add a motion sense, add motion sensor lighting on the building exterior to stay lit from sunset to midnight and do not utilize residential streets for overflow parking. <coughs> We also, unusually, have a recommendation from Borough President Katz, on, um, which is conditional, um, that the applicant should not park or store their vehicles on the nearby residential streets or sidewalks, so that's the same, and that the premises and sidewalks should be well maintained and clean and free of debris. Um, we asked for signage drawings and calculations. I only saw that the, the drawings measure the sign for the rental car and for enterprise, but not the other signs, um, and I didn't find signage calculations. Um, we also asked that the trash bin be shown on the plans, and I didn't see it shown. Um, and we also asked for to photos taken from inside the lot of the perimeter quest conditions. I didn't find that either. Um, there is an operational <coughs> plan that um, was provided that uh, should be included. The text of it should be included in our res resolution because it deals with how they're going to keep the parking off the streets um, and uh, also off the sidewalks and how they're handling the lighting. Um, now they're using 17 spaces for the rental cars and three for customers and I, that's they're assuming that that will succeed in keeping, um, preventing them from using the streets for their business. And the hours, just to clarify, the hours are Monday to Friday, 7.30 a.m. to 6 p.m., Saturday to Sunday, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Um, on the operational plan and the resolution, should it be con a condition of the resolution or? I think so, yeah. Oh. 
It's so it says security cameras are installed to monitor the parking lot as well as the interior office space. They operate 24 hours, 24 seven. An attendant will monitor both the parking lot and sidewalk area in front of the lot during normal business hours to ensure parking is left available for returning customers and to make sure no one is parking on the curb or stopping on the sidewalk as they pull into the lot. In the event this does happen, the cars will be moved immediately. So words to that effect in the conditions, right? We will adjust the timer setting for our parking lot lights so that one security light remains on throughout the night. As shown on the plan, three parking spaces are reserved for customer parking. And then it talks about landscaping and lighting. We don't need to. Um, uh, with regards to the enclosed fence in the drawing um, one, it's shown, I'm not sure if that's. The oh, that's the refuse yeah. area? Yeah. Oh. Does it say it? Yeah. Like, Existing six foot fifteen inch uh, wide kind of refuse enclosure chain oh. and uh, okay. privacy slots. Okay, good. So then that's that. Um, the signage, you're right. I mean, they have shown the signage on the building, but the the sign on the pole is the one that's missing in the drawings. Okay. That's um, and no calculations. Um, I didn't. I only found them dimensioning that elevation. Yeah. But then they don't add it up. They don't right. tell you what the regulations are. So they just are. need to revise A4, um, show the sign calculations, and include the poll. So. Right. OK. Anybody else on that one? Item number seven, 18005 BC, 1511 Third Avenue, Manhattan. Um, we're adjourning this. They're going to submit a variance application. Um, and we actually need it to be submitted by date certain because we can't just have this drag on and on. It's been here since November. So do you want to set a date tomorrow? So yeah, to so with the applicant rule. We'll okay. Item number eight, 18708 BZ, 124738 Street, Brooklyn. Okay, so we have photographs again of the steel having been removed. Um, plans were corrected as we requested. <coughs> With respect to security issues, um, I know that some commissioners went on a site visit so they could see how the security works in more detail. Um, they did submit a very detailed security uh, submission. Um, just, I used to do hardware schedules. That was like one of the very first things you do in an architecture office is like for six months you do hardware schedules. So the one that they gave actually is missing the tie into the floor plans. Um, but I. And so it doesn't explain how doors will be controlled in specific locations um, to prevent access to the children's floors. But in, I, I get the point. They, they have different kinds of controls. You can see in the drawings that they have um, security pads where you have the keypads. Um, uh, and it seemed like based on their um, other security drawing, which shows cameras in the keypad controls, there are hundreds of cameras in the building. And I just don't understand anything about how that actually works in real life because you're supposed to have a security guy who's looking at the flashing images all day. And it, it'd be like every 30 seconds, 2,000 flashing images or something. But that's their business, how they handle that. Um, and they also show nearly every door, including, including doors to closets with keypads. So this is one expensive security installation. Um, I just want to make a note to our council with respect to this whole subject of the site that the scope of the waiver that we're looking at is specific to a use group three school use in an MX district to allow an increase in floor area, lot coverage, maximum base height, setback, building height, rear yard, and rear yard equivalent. And these, these waivers are unrelated to the use group nine use that's also proposed in the building. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
and um, that's it. Anybody else? Any other comments? No, just <coughs> just one thing. Uh, while on site, we went to the very uh, bottom floor, and I have seen some um, some diagonal braces buckling. Diagonal braces are like when you put the excavation support system and you put some beams, we call them whalers on the perimeter, you put some braces to these beams and these braces could be horizontal across the lot or they could be diagonal. I did look at some of these braces. The building was in place, the foundation wall is in place, mm -hmm. but I have seen some of the whalers and the diagonal braces are kind of out shape. So I did, I did take, talk to the architect and the people who um, were on site at that time. I did suggest that they consult their structural slash geotechnical engineer, whoever designed this system, and make sure that before they cut these diagonal braces and whalers, they make sure that these, these elements are not taking loads and the loads are safely transmitted to the building including the foundation wall and the floor slabs and they make sure that the building itself when these loads are transmitted to the building elements they they can handle the lateral loads coming from the uh, the earth behind the excavation support system so i just wanted to put it on the record and we already informed them at the time of the site visit that they they should do that good thank you any other comments on this? No? Okay. Item number 9, 6513BZ, 123 Franklin Avenue, Brooklyn. Okay. Um, the main open issues on this application were the legality of the curb cut, um, which seems to have been addressed by DOB during plan review and will be subject to their review approval. And also um, Landmarks Commission's notice of no objection which we now have a copy of, um, and also revised financial analysis, which I'll leave to Commissioner Ollie Brown. So um, the issue with the financials that I originally raised had to do with the fact that the seller, I wasn't sure whether or not the seller as recreational space, as an amenity for all of the building occupants was adequately being reflected in the original financials that came with the original variance and the fact that the plans have now changed to show that number one there's a parking space in the cellar that's taking up part of the cellar space that used to be used as that recreational amenity but number two that the cellar in the current plans is actually um, accessed only by the apartment on the first floor and now is an extension of the first floor apartment into the cellar. So I did receive um, a letter, a financial letter, that basically stated that the previous financial report analyzed an open cellar that was recreational storage amenity for the residents above and was reflected in the then residential sales prices. Um, the final BSA approved plans actually showed an open cellar with a staircase that gave access to all of the residents from the ground floor hallway. But now, according to the new plans, as I said, the cellar is accessible to the apartment on the first floor only. Also, the final report previously analyzed one ground floor six bedroom apartment that encompassed the entire ground floor with no mention of a cellar anyway, anywhere. So, um, and that apartment was roughly double the two apartments that were right above. So aside from looking at the plans, the seller really wasn't addressed at all in that original report. There is no narrative that basically talks about the seller as being general amenity space for above. It's just kind of assumed. Another major issue is that that was condominium sales, and this is rentals. So it's a totally different income stream here, and it's a different type of project. So that alone is a reason to provide a new ground floor kind of financial report that encompasses the whole building as rentals. Um, they did provide a letter because they're assuming that the seller was actually 
um, considered in the previous financial report. They provide a letter that basically says the development cost to provide the seller would be roughly the same. I mean, to provide the parking in the seller would be roughly the same because the slight increase in site prep costs to provide access to the parking spot from the street would be offset by the savings of producing a smaller amount of finished interior space for residential use with the rest being the parking space. So the added value of one parking space is offset by the reduction in the building-wide amenity at the seller level, which would reduce the rents. However, as I said before, that's not the case now. And number two, the previous financial was based on sales of condos, and the new report is based on rents. So that letter <coughs> doesn't mean anything to us. Okay. So they really need to just start at ground zero, so to speak, and give us a brand new financial report. Account for the seller as connected to the first floor use only and not connected to the apartments above or change the plans that show that it's an open seller that's access to all and then you don't have to worry about that, but you still should give us a financial that shows rents because the whole point here is, is the minimum, minimum variance being impacted by the change of the seller use. And mm -hmm. so now that it's rentals, they have to prove that. And that gives that means giving rental comparables and everything, which they did not do in the letter that we received when this variance just came before us. Oh, well, all right. Okay, thank you. New cases. Item number 10, 933-28 BC, 125-24 Metropolitan Avenue, Queens. Right, we have to postpone this hearing because no notice of hearing was given. Item number 11, 4006 BZ, 10 Han Hanover Square, Manhattan. Um, this one we had um, a problem with notice at the last hearing, so we postponed it, and they were supposed to have sent out proper notice, and I don't see any signs of them having d done I that. Did, I did get from the applicant. I thought I forwarded to you on Friday. I'm sorry. Um, she gave me a couple of cover letters that said the hearing was for May 15th. She also gave me the green, the um, oh, she did okay. the slip that was stamped April 11th, April 12th, um, but I don't have the return April receipt 12th. cards. Okay. I've sent it to submit, and I thought I forwarded you a set on Friday. I'm you sorry. didn't see it. Um, but uh, so this a new hearing notice letter was submitted, right? We we gave them a new notice of public hearing on April 20 uh, oh, on March 28th, right? So it needed to notice the the May 15th hearing. Okay. So she sent this to oh, council member. Okay. All right. So it looks like yes, they gave notice. All right. Um, okay. So um, in terms of this one, I think we read the comments the last time, but I guess we should do it again because yeah. Um, notice. Okay. So. Um, Community board recommended approval. We have DOI for complete body. Um, I thought that the statement of facts was extremely confusing with respect to the history of the use. Um, so just to clarify, this is an application to extend the term of a 7336 special permit that was granted in 2006 after the accessory PCE use was made available both to Goldman Sachs employees um, located off-site and all and then to on-site residential occupants because this used to be a devoted Goldman Sachs PCE um, I'm not clear whether the establishment is still restricted to only these participants so that needs to be clarified this is also a change in operator there's also a change in operator that took over in 2012 the proposed hours are um, different than those approved so there's a lot that wasn't followed up here. Um, drawing seemed to be, and I was surprised not to see any submission on this because we did read the comments at the review session. I think um, they were working on the fire alarm system, but they still have this issue going on with the fire alarm to clear up the violation. Okay, but there were also drawings that needed to be submitted. So the drawings were missing doors. 
um, into many of the, some of the spaces. Um, and they need to clarify, as was done on the last set of approved plans, the areas that are the subject of the special permit, add the notes shown on those plans to these plans, and indicate location of elevator access to the cellar and subcellar. Those All that stuff could have been done while they were waiting for notice. Um, I, my notes are they should provide proof of functioning inspected um, sprinklers and alarms. And you mentioned, Tony, at the last review session that they were having an inspection, whenever that was, last week, so in March. Um, so I don't know what the status on that is. OK. I had a question. Um, the drawing shows that, uh, or I think the document says that they do have um, licensed massage therapist service provided, but copies of those licenses were not included. Okay. No, they were. They were? Anthony Giannone and John. Oh, this was in the original. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I nothing was, was submitted second, on the second. second. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was looking at the second package. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Move on. Mm -hmm. Item number 12, 4508 BZ, 55 Androvet Street, Staten Island. What? Staten Island? Yeah, yeah. Androvet Street. It's extension of time to complete construction. 4508 BZ. Do you have that? Not have that? I don't. 4508 BZ. Uh, no. What? No, I don't mm -hmm. have it. Oh, I have it. I have it. When was that? I don't know. I have it on mine. I don't have it on mine. Okay. So, so it was it. originally, <laughs> it was originally a variance for. So wait, this is a new case? No. Yes. Yeah. It's, a, it's an extension of time to complete. Okay. There was no notice, so we added it to, but I guess you did it before you guys copied it. Okay. Okay. Sorry. I just need to insert something. Just give me one mm -hmm. second. Insert. Okay. So what is it again? It's 4508 BZ. BZ. 55 Androvet Street, Staten Island. Okay. So it was real originally a variance for age restricted age restricted housing. It was going to be a three story, eighty one unit, greater older than fifty five year old. You know. Uh, <coughs> this is not my case. Okay. And. Um, this was back in 2008, and they have not completed um, construction. They have not even begun construction. And the reason was due to various agency permits and approvals that were needed in order to be able to get approved plans and permits. So there were CPC and New York State DEC fresh water wetland permits needed right. and DEP force main applications that were needed to be approved prior to them being able to get building permits. So now financing is in place and they're ready. I assume they have approved plans and can, can um, begin construction upon getting the grant of the extension of time. And they feel that they need four years, two years to complete construction and the rest to get the necessary sign off. So are you asking whether they have approved plans? You said you're yes. assuming they I do. am assuming so. I would be asking for clarification. Does that mean okay. they now have approved plans and are mm -hmm. just waiting to pull the permits? Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Apologies. I thought there was a financing component as well. They yeah. There was a it what? Financing is in place. Yeah, now. It said it was in place. Oh, okay. Yeah, previously yeah. they had the they had issues with financing, but they said yes, now financing is in place. Right. And I haven't I haven't seen any plans submitted. Uh, There's no need for plans unless they're asking for, for an extension. amendment. Okay. The plans right. they were approved in the previous <laughs> application still yeah. stand. Right. Um, they were pre um, approved by letter plans from 2011. If you want to look at any plans, I think that's the last ones we have. Good. And this was approved initially when? 2008. 2008. 2008. 2008. 2008 they made okay. a modification in 2011 by letter. 2009. Okay. Oh, yes, 2009. Um, I think 2009. 2009. Yeah, it was, it was voted on yeah. in 2009. Yeah. Yeah. And then there was an LSC in when? 2011. 2011. 2011. Okay. All right. So, for 
So wait a second. So did they apply for an extension in 2013? No. Okay. No extensions applied for. Uh, they would either have had to or have filed for a waiver of our rules now. And right. I, now I, I think don't. they did. Right? Let me see. Let me just look at my form. They applied. They put. They applied for a waiver of rules of the practice and procedure, okay. extension of time to complete construction, which expired 5-19-2017. Hmm. 2017? We're just, at, we're just wondering how they got eight years. Yeah, so they must have been here before. Oh, uh, last extension. Sorry, this wasn't mine. Anyway, we can we, we can, can figure it, it out. Okay. But so, but in case it's not in the description, we need to know how they got so how they've been here so long. Ah, in August 13, twenty thirteen, the BSA approved an application. Oh, for I'm sorry, an I was just going to say that. I, to complete construction. It's right in okay. front of my face here. <laughs> sorry. Okay. To sorry be completed that. by May 19, twenty seventeen. <laughs> okay. Good. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Good. Thanks much. All right. All right, so I've got that out of order. Okay, <coughs> thank you. Deci uh, appeals calendar decision items, item number 13, 2016-4268-BZ. I'm oh, sorry, 68A, 30 Prince Street, Brooklyn. Okay. Like cutting and pasting. Here we go. So the last hearing on this appeal was in January, and um, at which time the hearing was closed. The decision was deferred in March, I believe, at the appellant's request. Um, submissions were made by the appellant in March and by both appellant and DOB in April. I don't see that any of the submissions that were made <coughs> shed additional light on the subject. And we discussed our views on the sign in January. It's not the same sign structure, location, or size as may or may not have been painted on the parapet band somewhere in the 1960s. And there's also an argument that I just want to make sure we covered over the course of the hearings, um, because my notes aren't really picking up on it, but sometimes I can't listen and write at the same time. So that the sign should be, that the argument is that the sign should be grandfathered because it existed prior to the zoning change in 2001. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and just to add, I don't understand this argument since prior to 2001, the zoning text limiting the size of signs based on their distance from the arterial was already in place, as were the grandfathering provisions that we have been discussing here. And I found the CPC report that made a change, and so you can see whether it's new or underlined or whatever. Okay, so um, anybody else, any other? No, I agree with you. Um, thus far, um, any additional document provided has not uh, responded to the concerns and, or changed my opinion from the prior um, hearings. Okay. Anybody else want to? Not required. Just a few. Okay. Okay. Continued hearing items. Item number 14, 102.15A, 1088, Rossville Avenue, Staten Island. Um, they clarified that there uh, that there's no request for a side yard waiver, um, which we asked them to take out, right? And that three parking spaces are in fact provided as required by the zoning resolution. Front yard waivers are needed, however, and that's included in the description and the objections. There's an April 5th 18 DEP comment letter and an April 18th applicant submission in response, but I didn't find the DEP sign off. I've reached out to DEP and DOT. We don't have turn okay. yet. And we also don't have DOT sign off. Yeah, I mentioned that. I called them again this morning to, ask them okay. to remind them. I called them actually last week, so remind them again this morning. Anybody else? Oh, and we also have a, a Department of Health letter that indicates that the daycare, daycare is operating yes. there is now closed. closed. Yeah. Item number 15, may I go on? Mm -hmm. yeah, item number 15, 193, uh, 2017-193A through 199A. This is Tupelo Court in Staten Island. Okay. 
All right, fire department signed off on the plans on April 5th and provided uh, an April 9th conditional approval letter. Um, the condition should appear in our resolution, namely location of all hydrants shall be as indicated on the stamp plan. A minimum of two no parking signs complying with fire code. Should I read the fire code? Number? No. Um, shall be posted within the cul-de-sac. The homeowners association will be responsible for maintaining the cul-de-sac clear and of any parked vehicles, and will subject will be subject to enforcement action if not in compliance. All proposed residences shall be fully sprinklered, and two off-street parking spaces shall be provided for each residence. Um, we ask that the builder's pavement plan show the width of sidewalks and the same specifications that apply to the city-owned streets apply to to below court street um, a connection between tupelo and richmond is now shown on the builder's pavement plan which wasn't before but once we pass the property line nothing is shown on the building builder's pavement plan the last bsa plans that we that we have were submitted in september of 2017 and have many notes with respect to the private roadway, but none that say it will be constructed to comply with DOT requirements for public streets. So that note has to be added to the BSA set and indicate the same kinds of detailing and conditions on the pavement plan. Um, for I can, just as a uh, sample of the note, it says, all designs, materials, construction methods, and workmanship shall comply with the following publications of the Bureau of Highways. Standard specifications, standard details of construction, rules of Bureau of Highways operations, guidelines for the design of infrastructure components. All non-standard materials and construction procedures shall specifically be approved in writing by DOT. That's the standard note that goes on the builder's pavement plan and has to show up also on the BSA drawing. Um, the HO, the uh, Homeowners Association agreement was amended to include more information on maintenance. Um, there's a non sequitur in that paragraph that they gave us that I would like them to clarify. It's in the first sentence of the first paragraph on page 18, and it says, the association may increase or decrease its maintenance responsibilities, comma, gutters to the units, comma, or to paint or stain as necessary unit exteriors. I just don't understand how gutters fits into its maintenance responsibilities. That sounds like they're going to install gutter. I, I think it's a non sequitur. I, don't, I think it actually is a mistake. Um, maybe it's standard language in an HOA, but you're supposed to understand what you read. So um, there's also a restrictive declaration um, draft regarding maintenance and fire department conditions um, that was provided, but it isn't written in favor of any New York City government agency and doesn't specifically give fire department or DOT the right to remove cars parked in the no parking areas. Um, it also doesn't state specifically that sidewalks are to be maintained by the property association. It just says streets. And then they could say, oh, well, you didn't tell us about the sidewalk. So the word sidewalks needs to be in there. Um, I know that uh, we've been talking to fire department council who um, has told us that they believe that um, by statute, they have the right to enter onto a property and remove cars that are parked in areas where there's no parking permitted by the fire department. But that's kind of arcane lawyering. And a person who owns this piece of property should be put on notice that fire department may actually come in and using, I don't know what it is they use on their trucks or whatever, drag your car right out of there. So you should they should know that it's not private property, no one can trespass from the city, that the fire department or DOT or someone from the city can enforce these parking regulations. That's more like a, um, a, a warning to property owners. And um, most of the time, if we will look at, for exa example, a restrictive declaration from the Department of Buildings, it's always written in favor of the Department of Buildings, so the department can enforce. Here, 
there's no enforcement. So we, we have to talk about this. I see counsel making a face. Yeah, no, so I what we, should be to we have to figure something out because not the, 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 the um, city planning commission also used to do restrictive declarations where they had no, it wasn't written in favor of anyone. And so in this situation, we need to figure out something. Otherwise, they, they, they're meaningless, these restrictive decks. So someone has to be the beneficiary of this in some way. Um, that's that's how restrictive decks are typically written. Otherwise, they're paper. So we'll we'll work something out, but we won't do it here. So okay. I think there's also a new letter from the borough president on this. Oh. Mhm. Mm I emailed you on Friday. In strong opposition to this opposition. Yeah. Right. But so, but we go back to the reason that there's opposition to this case, if I'm not mixing up <coughs> with the others, has to do right with the wetland. Mm -hmm. And um, we know that community and and electeds are opposed to um, imposing on the buffer area of the wetland, but that's not our domain at all. That was DEC and city planning that worked together on this, and now there's a restrictive declaration in favor of, I think it's in favor of DEC, that um, protects forever that wetland area. So that becomes essentially an easement. Well, it is an easement, so it's, an, it's, it's essentially a conservation easement for that area, right? I, I, I agree with you, but I don't believe that's what the objection was. It was uh, about mapping the street. It was about mapping, mapping oh. the street. Do you want me to read it? Yeah. Okay. Um, dear Chair, this came on on Friday. Dear Chair Promoter, I am writing to oppose the above referenced applications. I formally request that the board require the mapping of Tupelo Court. Once again, the plain language of GCL 36 is being interpreted by city agencies that have not been assigned the specific authority to grant exemptions from the state statute. Specifically, Department of Buildings has arbitrarily decided that structures which are accessed solely from the unmapped private road to Tupelo Court can be issued certificates of occupancy. That is contrary to plain language of th GCL 36 Section 2. Once the agency decision was rendered, the owner then filed for new detached garages accessed from Tupelo Court that also did not require a BSA review. Additionally, the DOT is waiving street, sidewalk, curb improvements along the map portions of Richmond Road adjoining the structures which may only be accessed from Tupelo Court. If the board does not ask why the other proposed structures are not filed or how they comply with the spirit of the law, then the BSA would also be complicit in ignoring the state statute and the protection for Staten Islanders it affords. Our map street system should be part of the solution for smart planning, not a nuisance to be excused out of hand. Here's an example where the city has title to the map street yet is still ignoring the greater good. We're allowing the developer to maximize profits without meeting the minimum standards established for the development. At the end of this exercise, we will not have constructed the previously mapped streets. We will have built new buildings and portions of existing street grid. We will not have mapped, but we have we will not have mapped the new private roads. We will have not have improved the arterial street that adjoins the property in question and provides throughout the residents of Richmond Town and other local communities. This is a type of enforcement that negatively affects the community and people of Staten Island. Um, I've spoken out against this project for more than a decade. This development plan will have adverse effects on the performance dynamics of the Blue Belt, as well as the quality of life for the existing adjoining homeowners and unsuspecting new home buyers who will never understand that their home is built in a street, while no one will buy it because it is in a street, or why their children can't use their own backyards due to constant flooding. It is therefore extremely important that these projects be scrutinized for complete compliance. The value of a street system that is part of the city map and is an essential part of the transportation and drainage plans for the borough should be preserved at all costs, at least until there are viable alternative proposals that accomplish the goals of the original mappings. Development proposals should be reviewed to determine whether or not they are an integral part of the greater community or compounds that are effectively walled off from the neighborhood. Our goal should be to integrate new development into our existing neighborhood fabric, a fabric that includes existing building stock, streetscape concepts, and the map street system that has been established. Growing our neighborhood is much more desirable than building developments that turn their back to the community. I strongly oppose to this latest attempt 
by agencies and the applicant to move forward with a project that is not fully reviewed for compliance with all applicable rules. I hope I can count on the board to uphold this responsibility assigned under GCL 36. Please accord this request every consideration consistent with your rules and regulations. Thank you for your kind attention regarding this important community issue. Um, sincerely, James G G S. Otto, Borough President of Staten Island. Okay. We'll, uh, we'll look at the closer at the kinds of questions that he's raising about agency review. But um, hey, it, the part where there are structures that are built, I don't believe that this has come back for that. The, if there are new structures built, they should have to come back. Uh, they don't come back. Because if it's a garage, it's not required to have frontage. That, that's actually what the rules are, right? right. So, if, yeah, a garage isn't required to have 8% frontage because mm -hmm. it's not occupied. So these are things where the firefighters need to have. And now, with, with a waiver, you're giving fire department access with fire department sign-off to the fronts of the buildings, right? So that's that's the whole point that the width of the roadbed is considered wide enough um, for the fire trucks to get down, hence no parking on the sides of the roadbed, right? Hence the need for fire department to be able to remove those cars if they're illegally parked there, right? That kind of thing. So garages never needed to come back. If they were building another house on the lot, that certainly would need to come back. If they were subdividing it further and decide to add yet another house, which I don't think they can by zoning. Right. Um, and then in terms of other approvals, we'll take a look at that, but we'd certainly send it to DEP, to, D, to well, DEC has looked at this site very thoroughly in terms of the wetlands, and we send it to DOT, and we send it to the fire department. So. Um, and we require that the, that the information on the drawings in terms of DOT standards are, are met, right? That it's the same construction quality standards. And there's the HOA agreement and a restrictive declaration that requires the um, property owner, the association to maintain the streets. Uh, and that's the reason for the restrictive declaration is to put on additional notice the property owners that they are responsible for maintaining the streets themselves um, because most people don't read their HOA agreements but maybe um, a lawyer who's helping on a closing will point out the fact that there is this separate restrictive declaration if the lawyer is doing even 10% of their responsibility. Okay. Okay, move on. Mm -hmm. Item number 16, 2017, 254, 255A, 115, 117, Orbutus Avenue. I think that's the proper name. <laughs> so we received a draft of the Homeowners Association Agreement, which makes clear that the HOA members have an access easement over the area <coughs> described as a, quote, driveway, um, and that the HOA will maintain the driveway and all utilities related to it. In this case, the word sidewalk doesn't need to come up because, in fact, much to my chagrin, frankly, there is no sidewalk. They're, they're using this permeable material to create sort of a walking area that cars can pass between, but it needs to be as wide as it is without a curb, otherwise fire trucks can't get down. So, you know, I, I personally hate this project because I think it's sub, it, it, it is a way of getting around the regulations for, for side yards um, because you, instead you're using the roadbed as a side yard. But there's nothing, you know, the zoning doesn't disallow this. So then this is, this is more of my opinion that this is just a way, a new concept of getting away around the zoning resolution. But that's for the Department of Buildings to decide. And I haven't, um, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I apologize. I don't mean to interrupt. Um, I did ask Glenn um, Garcia um, Duran from CPC if they had filed any of the ac any CPC actions. Um, I haven't heard anything back from them. Right, because they're going to need school seats for three houses. It's uh, school. It's uh, open, and I forget what the other one is. Uh, topography. Topography. And that's tr yeah. Um, trees. Yeah. Right, but okay. they also have to do a subdivision, I believe. In this, they do. Is this a subdivision in this um, one? No, it's two no. zoning lots. Just two zoning lots. Okay. Yeah. It's two. Two zoning lots with four houses. 
four two. tax lots. So basically, two, each zoning lot is going to consist of two tax lots. Mm -hmm. right. And two of the lots actually are frontage right. on a map street. So they're all involved because there are required parking spaces <coughs> on the un... On, it's not even an unmapped street. It's really a driveway. This isn't qualifying as a um, private road. Um, just let's see. They also provided a draft restrictive declaration, and my comments are the same on this one. That includes maintenance and parking restrictions. Um, and again, it's not written in favor of any agency, but it also specifically doesn't give fire department um, right of access, and or at least put property owners on notice that their cars could be towed by any one of a number of agencies. Um, there was a. April 26th response to a DEP um, March 5th comment letter, but I don't see DEP sign off on that either. No, I haven't seen anything yet. Okay. Anybody else? <laughs> <coughs> DEP's uh, letter dated March 5th. Uh, they didn't raise any issue, but they just said the DEP Water Bureau certified a drainage plan in 2017, which is valid for two years. But they didn't raise any other issues. But they, but it's not so a, I don't think it was I don't a sign-off. that's a sign-off, but... That wasn't a sign-off because then they say, we will continue to review. Until you see them say, we're good to go okay. with this, it's not a sign-off. Okay. okay. Okay, I have new items. Item number 17, 257, 15A, 1221 Forest Hill Road, Staten Island. Okay, where am I here? We have proof of notice of hearing to officials, um, but I actually can't find proof of service of the initial application to officials, although we do have a community board recommendation, which is to disapprove 29 to 3. Um, so 29 to disapprove, three to approve, one abstention. Um, there was no explanation given. The applicant um, needs to speak to that and we'll reach out to the community board. As well. uh, yeah, I raised it with the applicant because, um, I'm sorry, uh, I raised that with the applicant because I believe that the disapproval was based on the initial application of a school. This is something different yeah, maybe. Now. So then I raised it with the applicant who had gone back to community board. Um, I reached out to community board. Unfortunately, I didn't get a call back. I'll call them right. again. To see, I don't think they went back to community board to show them the new proposal. It, it could be because they that. make reference a little note that says we're against it because of a school, and then mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't understand what's going on. Yeah, because that was a prior iteration was the school, and then they changed it to a residential with community facilities. But I have to say, even if it wasn't about, even if it's not about a school, I kind of get why they would be opposed because I find this a really a uh, problematic application. Um, I don't see really why the application is here. Um, and um, and that's probably why it was prosecuted. It's been sort of working its way through the BSA for almost two years where it was submitted and then they didn't submit anything. And I believe this received a dismissal warning. Yeah, it did. And then it took them a year to respond. Um, after the dismissal warning. I mean, they submitted a little something and then it took them like nine months to respond actually. Um, the proposed building is 145 feet long on a 354 foot site, long site, the rear third of which is an adjacent wetland area. The imposition into the widening line is one inch. The real motivation for this application appears to be a waiver of the front setback requirements. And, and my opinion is that using a GCL waiver as a way to skirt the zoning resolution is not what it's for, right? So aerial views show all the other buildings on Forest Hill Road setting back from the widening line, um, as do the does the existing building on the site. Um, and I don't see anywhere in the zoning calculation sheet compliance with height and setback requirements relative either to the widening line or the property line. Um, I'm just going on with the rest of the comments, but I'm, I'm not in favor of this application. Um, there's a DOT March 15 letter with comments and a DEP um, November 28th letter with comments, none of which were responded to, which gives you kind of an idea about the tentative nature of this application to begin with. It, it seems like they're just throwing, 
throwing it at the wall and seeing if it sticks. And if it does, they'll do the work, right? But for me, it doesn't stick. And anybody else? I agree with you. I think when I was reviewing the application, I was trying to figure out why is the application before us for a one inch and a two inch uh, encroachment into a map street? Why couldn't the building move back? And uh, and the only reason is as you stated. So. If they are seeking this, it should then be a variance application and not a GCL. Right. Just send the building back by a foot. You therefore don't need your GCL wa waiver. Come back and argue why you need the front yard setback waiver. I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah. Just to make the argument. Right. But, I don't know but um, so, and un unless that is clearly stated in the statement of facts as to the need programmatically that is driving that, the site conditions that are driving us, those are all arguments towards the variance. Mm -hmm. I, again, I, I question why it's before us for GCF. I, I didn't really see uh, right. <laughs> enough for a variance either in, in there. No. I, I didn't see enough no. for a variance either. I just, I, I second your, or third your opinion on this just being, it seems to be commonly used the GCL for purposes of getting something else done, um, a waiver, but um, I'm, I'm No, so actually it's not commonly used. So in every application that I've seen, Commissioner Otley Brown's seen way more, right, um, they're legitimately needing because the site forces, well, for one, the entire neighborhood is built in the bed of the street widening. That's the first part of it, right? So they're just, in the typical site, they're just building where everybody else is building, but now they have to come for a GCL waiver because DOB used to do this as of right, right? And then it doesn't qualify for the statutory exclusion because none of the houses, say, have certificates of occupancy or something. So they are forced to build within the street widening. And because you're forced to build within the street widening, you need to also get a waiver of the front yard setback requirements because you need to measure the setback off of your property line now as opposed to the street widening line. So it's quite a common tandem application. But that's the first time where I've seen one where they're intentionally building forward of the widening line just a little tiny bit so that clearly they qualify for what they really want, which is the front yard waiver. So, and because they qualify, oh, not the front yard, the setback waiver, because they, they meet the front yard requirements. They even meet it with respect to the widening line. What they don't meet is the setback requirement. Well, I agree, I agree with you. There, there's a bit of an analogy to on the last case where they're turning the house around because of the, the side yard waiver. On, on the, the preceding case where they turned the building around so they have a side yard waiver. No, they're not getting a side yard waiver. It, but you're, they, oh, you're saying, saying they're using the GCL to get around providing No, because the side yard is permitted. The side yard is, is complying and not extreme. They're providing an eight foot side yard. Commit right. Well, Chair's issue with the application on that was that in the zoning resolution, it just says side yard. It does not say a side yard which can become a private driveway is therefore not a side yard. And, and right oh, now, in right. that case, in Arbutus, it's being, Arbutus, I'm sorry, I, I'm uh, it's being used as a side yard which is becoming a driveway. However, the zoning does not prohibit, uh, prohibit it. So it's technically, from a zoning calculation Why? point of view, it is a side yard and therefore it's permitted. And and actually, Ar Arbutus is a is a GCL 36 waiver. This is a GCL 35 waiver. So this is to build in the bed of a map street, which comes along with often front yard and front yard setback waivers because sort of by or sometimes. They're also considered side yard setback waivers. No, actually never no, never would be. Um, no, never side yard. So we actually have another one a little bit further up the lane where they had shown that they needed a side yard waiver. And we said, you can't have a side yard waiver with respect to a GCL 35 because the side yard waiver has nothing to do with the bed of the street. And they said, oh, our mistake. We didn't actually mean that. We actually meant a front yard waiver. It was just a okay. typo. Okay. Okay. 
Item number 18, 2017 5 through 2017 7A, 620A, 620B, 620C, Sharrett's Road, Staten Island. Okay. This is a retail warehouse. Right. So we have proof of service of initial application to officials. We have green cards sent on 418 to officials, but it isn't really clear if that was notice of hearing or not. I, you know, I guess it must be because it's 418, but there was no letter provided this is all about us coming up with a very clear direction on what notice should look like you have to submit it with a cover letter so we know what those green cards are for um, the community board recommends approval with one opposed um, I there are sidewalks on Charitts Road this site needs to provide them to um, DEP uh, has a March 5th letter with comments the applicant responded and included the existing declaration of easement and maintenance um, they responded on April 26th so we're waiting for DEP right that was sent to DEP we haven't received yeah. anything okay. yet but I think they were responsive yes and there's a fire department um, August of 2017 conditional letter of no objection um, and the condition is provided all the structures are fully sprinklered which it says on the drawing but I thought there was a lot anybody else on this one? Wait a minute, I thought there was a lot of little No. I need my mouse. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so August. Item number 19, 2017, 234A, 266 Wild Avenue, Staten Island. Okay. We have proof of service of initial application and notice of hearing to officials. Community board recommends disapproval with one in favor. However, this community board generally opposes all the GCL 36 applications. Um, DEP on March 5th had a comment letter. Um, I didn't see a response to that from the applicant. I'd like to know why they didn't plant street trees. Um, the sidewalk is 10 foot six wide. Sometimes we see like four foot wide sidewalk, so then I get it, but this is a 10 foot six wide sidewalk, so it could handle tree pits. Um, they should provide a note on the drawing that the building will be fully sprinklered. Uh, and I also didn't find a fire department comments on this one. Okay. I also make note on the three new cases. I resent them to the borough president's office again, just to make sure they have comments. Okay. This is the same board as the forest um, street uh, application that we heard. Um, so I think consistently board. they are opposing any mm. GCLs. So that's community kind of board, yeah. That community community board. So that also board too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. board. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But in this case, I get it. <laughs> and, I mean, in that case. Zoning calendar decision items. Item number 20, 2016, 4138BZ, 323, 27A of the Americas, Manhattan. We're deferring this? Yeah, they requested an adjournment. It's, yeah, deferral to mid July. They're waiting for LPC, that's the issue. Item number 21, 2016, 4271BZ, 201 Hampton Avenue, Brooklyn. Um, I'm I'm okay on the submission, um, and then uh, the issue is that uh, we need um, so you know so they weren't able to get a ZRD one CCD one on the flood regulations, so that'll be a con and that's because of like a bumpy review process. So um, in other words, DOB refused to answer them. It wasn't like they never got anything. They went to it, they submitted, and DOB just said, don't ask us for a ZRD1 like this. So rather than hold this up, I think we should condition approval on DOB's complete review. Because they already, they did what we asked them to do. They went to DOB and they asked for a ZRD1, and, and DOB said, Otherwise, what are, what are you proposing they do I mean, instead? Just to, just to be completely, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, 
Uh, he, it's undermining the entire request of anyone to ever re re look for. So then, what do we, so then what do we do? I don't. I, I don't mean, know what to do. They we condition all approvals on uh, on subsequent approval and and. I mean, if they were able to get an IMUZ, can they go back or? I don't. I don't know if they can go back on the same question. Is the point? So if then, so if there's no way for them to go back, what are we supposed to do? No. Right. I, I don't know the answer. That's that's the thing. So unless we have something worked out with DOB. Where if the applicant submits and DOB says, I'm not going to look at it, I don't know what to do. Yeah. No. So we can talk That's about another this agency. more. That's a That's an undermined process. Agency. We can require that everyone go do this and give and clarify how they ask the questions. But this was actually one of the very first that went for a ZRD1. The only other two we have, one was, a, one was the, the housing project. That, and one was um, uh, an apartment building, and those were the only two that have gotten successful review. And you know that depends on who your plan examiner is and all of that. Varies from borough to borough. Yeah, and it very, very. So from the other administrative borough. agency has den right. denied right, and it very, and so until we have, so we, and we've learned from those two how the submission should be made and in this case they were they were one of the very first so they didn't ask the questions in the same way so now we're asking them to go twice I don't know. I don't think it undermines anything we're trying to figure out how to do this so okay well well I think in this case we can um, and I, I think with any project where we do think they would need a ZRD, a CCD one for um, all the flood for a flood thing that should be in the drawings even after uh, let's say they have gotten a ZRD CCD one no, for our BSA file the BSA drawing should indicate that a thorough ZRD CCD one or a flood analysis uh, uh, regulation analysis should be conducted e even no, after no 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 that's not how it works so so. We have an administrative notice that says anyone <coughs> who is in a floodplain has to go get a ZRD1. Anybody who's already submitted as of January, that, that was actually the rule. Anyone who had submitted an application as of January 2017 must go to DOB and get a ZRD1, CCD1 review of floodplain for their project. Anyone who submits subsequent to January has to get plan review prior to submitting to us. In other words, DOB has reviewed it and, you, and we have some kind of indication on the objection sheets that it was reviewed, right? So in this case, um, they came to us in, well, the last hearing was in July, then there was a February hearing, right? And so we directed them to go in February and get a ZRD1. They went and got a ZRD1. But, but DOB said, essentially, we're not going to, we're not looking at it. So, because they were, literally, they were one of the first. Our, our hearing was February 13th, and the, and the administrative notice was January. So they were literally the first. And so, um, but in, in all cases, going forward, Everybody has to go and get a ZRD1. We don't condition it. The, the problem has been that we've been looking at projects where we don't know if they're properly lifted. We don't know if they've done, if there are substantial improvements. And we're being, we've been asked to make the call and we can't. And then it turns out it's a substantial improvement and we're looking at the wrong house. That, that or whatever. That's been the issue. So it's not that everything is going to be conditioned on compliance with code. It always is, right? But because we don't know whether it's even at the right elevation when we're reviewing it, we need them to have DOB determine that this is being properly handled. That, that's the problem. It affects the actual building that we're looking at, the height of the building and everything. That's why we need a pre ZRD1 review. You see? Well, I, I understand that we are trying to make sure that whatever we review at the end of the day is what is um, DOB is going to approve. But let's say if we don't get the ZRD1 and we do review it based on what the applicant is proposing, that they will get an approval from DOB and DOB reviews it and then determines that 
no, the elevation should be instead of five. Yeah, they'll have to come should, back. It would come back. And but we don't my, want that. We don't want them to come back. We want to be reviewing the right elevation. So in this situation, they went to get it. And, you know, a lot of this is the same thing that happened to us with the fire alarms. We were telling everybody, go install the fire alarm. And then the fire department and DOB wouldn't sign off on the fire alarm applications. So temporarily, we had to sort of adjust to what's happening with the other agencies and now we have in place a great protocol where fire department and DOB will review. So we need to improve the protocol on these ZRD ones, but I think that it's torturing the applicant if we make them go back a second time when they already asked. So I'm, my interest isn't torture, my interest is information um, and to do it once. So I, I think that it's not undermining the protocol. We are going to have to talk to DOB about how we can ensure that everyone who submits gets a ZRD1 review properly. Okay. 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 Continued hearings, item number 22, 23415BZ, 122367th Street, Brooklyn. Okay, so I know Commissioner Shonda had some analysis that I didn't understand on this, so I'm just going to read my notes and then we can, because I actually didn't understand when I'm looking at your, when I'm looking at the drawings. So at the last hearing, um, we discussed with the architect that he would go to DOB and have DOB review the option B um, and and um, have the other, and in the process have the other objections besides floor area be removed. So in other words, DOB is signing off on height and setback and all that stuff. And so there isn't any sign that that actually happened. Um, um, and we intentionally allowed a lot of time for that to occur. Um, so the only DOB denial that we have is the one that was submitted with the initial application back in. Um, September of 2016 um, uh, and the initial denial which is exhibit is six exhibit B is for floor area and perimeter wall height and perimeter we've discussed already that we're not going to weigh perimeter wall height we don't have the authority to do that right and they got a ZRD1 from borough commissioner to tell how you measure perimeter wall height so that's no longer a discussion for us, right? And so what they did was they said, we're going to go with option B because option B is the one where they have the top floor has a setback um, so that it doesn't exceed the perimeter. So, oh, I, think I forget exactly. I think option A. a. Option A. They're saying option B is more difficult because that requires them realigning the rear. Right. Uh, okay. Option A is what they were saying. Oh, so there. Okay. So, but there was. They provided an axonometric that shows the building fitting into a zoning envelope. So, um, so now I'm confused because I don't know if that's option A or option B that fits in the zoning envelope. But that's the one that they're showing. So we asked them to provide that axonometric. That way, I listened to the video again. We asked them to provide the axonometric to show it fits within the envelope. The idea of going back to DOB was so that we don't have to figure out whether the, a building shape like this is meeting the envelope points, right? But meanwhile, they did show this axonometric. It looks like it fits within the envelope, right? So now whether that's option A or B, I'm quite confused because we also don't have a complete set of drawings where that envelope is attached to those drawings. So actually, I'm not sure which which drawing that's for okay. right so that that's part of it it's like I'm confused because these were submitted independently um, without being tied to a set of drawings so that's my problem so mm -hmm. if it's a or B because I don't know what letters it is it's the one that complies that's the one we want the one that complies the next question that they were asking um, so, and it's, whether it's A or B, it's the one that complies, and we need a full set of drawings for that. The drawings must exist, but the, the architect needs to put them together into one package so we know what goes with what, right? 
Um, we also ask that the applicant reconstruct their neighborhood character analysis to be responsive to the changed form of the building. Um, so they made submissions of um, streetscape elevation and maps, um, the most useful map of which were the ones showing the number of buildings on the social block with flat roofs. I didn't find the other maps particularly helpful. Um, the map showing that there are buildings with balconies or terraces wasn't that helpful since it didn't compare their typologies. You know, if you're a, a little Cape Cod with a balcony, it's not the same thing as a box with a setback. So I, I didn't find that useful. Um, and, you know, actually, I think that um, the team, the applicant team, have done a really, they're not regular BSA applicants and that they've done a really, really good job here in trying to make their arguments in, in, um, and so on. So um, part of the request to have them write down their argument was for them to do it and experience writing um, an urbanism argument, which unfortunately they declined to do. So I, I'm just sorry that they didn't give it a try. We can build the narrative ourselves, but they should have written it down. That way they can learn how to articulate the urbanism narrative and we'll find that extremely useful in, in the future. So, but anyway, we can infer because there are a lot of square or let's say rectangular buildings on this block. It's a lot of different typologies that are rectangles. Um, though I didn't, I couldn't figure out which ones actually had setbacks that are similar to this one. But um, just because I didn't see data on that. But anyway, so that's what I mean. A, and, a or B, I don't care what letter it is. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, I have to commend the applicants. They, despite not having a full knowledge of how um, BSA actions and reviews are done and documentations that are required, they've really done their best to try to help us give as much information. And it has been done in, in, in piecemeal basis and not no fault of theirs. I think it's just that they're not familiar with the, what we ask for. And so we are also reviewing them in bits and pieces and trying to put them all together. And that is that I think may have led to some of the uh, understanding of where is what data lying and how do we connect the pieces. Um, the, what they had submitted at the last hearing were two options, option A and option B. Both of them started off with the uh, issue of addressing the perimeter wall height. Once DOB determined that there was a perimeter wall height that was going to be defined from the base plane up to the height of 25 feet, in both options A and option uh, um, options A and B, they proposed to set the building back above the height of 20 uh, 25 feet. Uh, so that would address the perimeter wall height. What they did in option. A was leave the rest of the building as is and show how that is complying. And I had a question to that um, because I was trying to figure out whether it is compliant per the zoning regulation. And um, just before I continue, sorry. I just want to make sure that so when I listened to the video, unless you did too, so yeah. uh, when I listened to the video, the architect was arguing at that hearing that DOB had given him two options. One was to use the, the base plane as the measuring height, and the other one was curve height. So my understanding of what option A and B were, were one using curve height no, no. and one mm -hmm. using base no, plane, elevated base. No. no. I think, okay. Uh, I, I think he took away, the, he was given two options, you're absolutely right. But he, he thought he was given two options. Yeah. Which we said, no, you weren't no, given No, you two were options. not. But he did, he, I think, realized to his benefit that the base plane option serves him better to make the argument because the amount of setback he would have to do on the third row. He didn't say that, but I think that was went through his analysis process that that would reduce, minimize the amount of uh, removal of existing structure he would have to do. So he went with the base plane argument and, and uh, you uh, accepted the base plane at a higher elevation and measured the perimeter wall height from that. And in both these options, he does show the perimeter wall height set back above 25 feet. 
So in option two, what option he, B. Oh, sorry, thank you. Option B, what he proposed was a much more complicated roof line configuration, trying to match it with what we see in the zoning resolution um, sections where um, you know you're supposed to have a pitched roof above uh, at an 80 no more than 80 degree angle um, but uh, that was to try to make the argument that it is uh, it is the other alternative and it it would be uh, he was trying to respond I think to the issue that was raised the neighborhood context and he was trying to say well if I mold the uh, uh, mold it in this shape which is also complying you know would it meet the neighborhood context? That was the question he was trying to pose, and he was hoping that he would get some response from us, that we would say, okay, go with A or B. But, um, and I think we then asked, because the B elevation was so complicated, we couldn't figure out whether it was fitting within the envelope. He provided in the last submission um, an axonometric of B mm -hmm. um, to show how it fits within the envelope. <coughs> What I go back to is that is option A compliant, which is the minimal amount of removal of the existing structure that would be take, needed to make the building compliant, especially from the waivers that we cannot grant, um, which is the perimeter wall height. Right. Um, and I was reading the zoning resolution text, and I thought I understood, but I wanted a clarification. and. Uh, I had reached out to the Department of City Planning Zoning Division to kind of clearly understand that section and the applicability of that section. And uh, what I came over, uh, what it confirmed my um, reading of the zoning resolution that is option A is uh, does uh, comply with the bulk, bulk envelope. Uh, it does not need to set back from the rear because it is very much inside the 30 foot rear yard line. It does not need to set back from the side yard because it, the side yard width minimum requirement is eight feet and here the side width is much more than that. So the setback, it is well within the setback envelope on the side yard. Doesn't it now, need a side yard waiver? On, There's it's one a zero side. lot line building. It's a zero okay. lot line building and it has, uh, that was established right at the beginning that this is a zero lot line building and in an R41 a zero lot line building is permitted. So the the we need they are side. removing a small portion the, of the side yard. Yeah, they rear. are removing a portion of the side in the rear. Yeah, that is true. But they so they need a side yard side yard waiver from us because the extension is within the. Just to be clear, it's not a side yard, yard waiver. This is a special permit, not a variance. So they're it's, it's they're extending. Well, they're increasing the degree yeah. of non-compliance in one in, of the side yards. Right, 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 right. but. So, um, so, so that's sorry. but that's the part. I, well, it's actually also horizontally because there's the existing building that is needing to be extended. And if I look at the existing building drawing, there's a structure within the side yard that is being added. It's a three-story enlargement within the. Is any within. part of that the parapet? No, 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 never mind the parapet. It's a three-story enlargement. You see, it's a two-story building, and there, and the building kind of had a, a, a jog in it. On the side yard? On the side. So it didn't, it, it only a portion of the building extended to whatever the depth of that side yard is. So I thought that that side yard is also being filled in. The... As I, we've been so we at had this asked so them long. to use the 1987 as the base plan, uh, uh, yes. as, the, as the base uh, drawing, and in that they did have a side yard uh, encroachment in the rear, which, as part of the 2007 approval, which was rescinded, they had removed it, but they had extended a little bit into the rear yard in the side, uh, where they, may, they they would have been required to provide a five foot rear yard but they are private side, side yard. Sorry. I'm sorry. This is what happens when you don't sleep online. Um, 
<laughs> uh, five foot side yard, um, but in um, they um, and I think this is probably where they need the rear yard, the side side yard waiver. But they're except. Yes. So that's the thing. That's, that's the point is it's not just a vertical enlargement; it's a horizontal enlargement of in within the required side yard compared to what the what we're considering the existing building. But right? it being a zero lot line building. My question is, do they even need the side yard waiver? Because zero lot line building is permitted in an R41, and the existing building but is it's a zero either, lot line building. Either it's zero or it's five feet or whatever the minimum rule is. It's not kind of, sort of, right? Hmm. So either you're creating a new non -com Well, that's a question. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah. they could extend the zero lot line. They could all extend the, way the, to the zero. Yeah. 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 Right. Which it, which is actually, if you think about it, to get your head around it, it's easier to extend the zero yeah. as yeah. of right. Yeah. That, but they don't want to do new construction. The, see, part of the problem here is this building exists. Right. And the whole idea right. is to avoid new construction. Absolutely. So and I'm right. having a little trouble getting my head around now that you mention it. It's zero lot line on one side, and it's either five feet or zero, mm -hmm. right? And if they're trying to have less than five feet, then that's a waiver that's not a straight line extension. Right. Okay. Which is what our authority is. So you but, could say but, this is less than... But we have in other, and we do see a lot of these special permits where, and we are going to see one of the new cases where um, the building has an existing non-complying side yard, and then they are um, going to extend uh, the side yard, but it is going to be, um, it's going to be not non-compliant. It's yep. going to be. No, but you that's can't right. lessen the amount of open space between the side of the building and the side lot line. Right. So all you could do is extend the non-complying side yard. Otherwise, so, they're into I mean, their required I minimum mean, of five feet on each side. Yeah. So that's tricky. If that. So we, they often reduce the extent of the imposition. That we see quite a lot. Right. But in in this situation, it's a zero lot line building where that same lot line now is being proposed, unless I'm just reading the drawing, as having like a five, three a foot, four, three, three foot, foot side yard, right? Which doesn't exist, so it's not a straight line extension, so now it's a different set of side yard rules. Because zero is a permit is permitted, and so they don't even need us for, for a straight line extension of a permitted zero lot line. So that side, that's, now. So there so it's it's actually sort of ironic, but it's safer from our perspective if it's a straight line extension of the zero lot line side. Well I, help me understand this. I, yeah, because I mean you have uh, here you have so let's say we, forget about the zero lot line. If we have a zoning lot uh, where we, one is required to provide a four foot wide side yard. Yeah. Okay? Mm -hmm. They have an existing building that has a three foot wide side yard. Mm -hmm. And the extension that they are doing, yeah, or let's make it two foot, two foot, they have an existing two foot wide side yard. But the extension that they're making in the rear, it's not four foot, they're required to provide a four foot side yard, but it's not four foot, but it's three feet. But we do They're reducing the degree of non-compliance. A zero lot line is not non-compliant. They're creating a new non-compliance. But we have seen in our four districts also situations like that where we do allow them to reduce that. No, but zero lot line, unless today, which it might be because I've lost track because we've been looking at this so long, a zero, unless today a zero lot line building is not allowed, no, in which case, not. so if it's still allowed, then that's an as of right knock yourself out, extend along your zero lot line. So I, I'm just question, putting a question. If they were to just thicken this wall. There you go. Mm -hmm. Just thicken the wall on the ground. Easy to say. It's called construction. Right? Mm -hmm. It costs money to do construction. They're trying to avoid it. But anyway, so. Uh, I think that's a question to ask them and, and see whether that's. Isn't there a stair up there? No. 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 That's just hatching. Or yeah. Something. What is that? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, so there you go. So there's another issue I didn't even see. I, I just but thought I, I just assumed that this is not something they would need a waiver on because it's from zero and to the, 
It's, it, but now you're creating, it goes from an allowable lot lines condition to a not allowable lot kind of condition. That's the problem. It's not that they have an existing non-compliant condition. They have a total compliant condition. But this is not something DOB picked up. In, in the DOB objection, it was the perimeter wall height and the frontier. Um, uh, I, uh, right? Was it the... What was no, the but they, they don't have any side floor yard area. objection. Right. Floor, floor area. area. Yeah, it was the perimeter. floor area. Right, but that's not the... So if they wanted to risk not having a waiver on side yards, Knock yourself out, right? But I'm going to end up in the same situation they were in because right. it's going to be approved and then audited, audited and then reversed, and then now they're coming back to us again. Yes, and that's why I wanted it to be clear that they have the side yard um, objection, or I don't know if that's you know that's a DOB whatever the rule. We're normally supposed to be responding to objections, right? So. We could waive the side yard, but not wait. We could allow them under the special permit the side yard waiver, um, and I don't know whether we can do it without um, an objection from DOB. We don't have no, we one. Don't, don't have one. We need the, we need the objection if we're going to grant the relief. Right. Obviously. That's what my understanding was, and even and we don't have anything since September that indicates the side yard is an issue, and in, in any event whether it's that side yard or the vertical extension, they, need, they needed it. <coughs> so the, on the other side, what, what's the dimension of the side yard, the bigger dimension? This one? This is a complying side yard? Yeah. Okay. It's probably like 10 feet, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay. So the question still remains to me, the enclosed balcony. Are we putting something on the plans that say to be signed off on by DOB because we're not, because the enclosed balcony, right. is it encroaching in the front yard? They're saying no, it's a permitted obstruction, obstruction. in the front right. yard, but it looks like it's floor area because right. it's enclosed it on three and a half area. stars, which means... So that was why I thought that the option B was the one and why the axon and met. So maybe the problem is that the, that the option B was handling a lot of subjects simultaneously. It was getting rid of the enclosed balcony. Neither no. of those options oh. get rid of the enclosed really? balcony. No. They both have the enclosed balcony. Why? Yeah. And, and yes. that's something that we've talked about right. from the beginning. And they keep and saying it's it's a permitted obstruction and they're not going to have a problem. So but my question was, since they are pulling back on the third floor anyway, why can't we put on the plans to be determined by DOB? And if DOB determines it's not a permitted obstruction, then they have to cut back the third floor terrace because now the third floor is going to just be a terrace overhang and there's not going to be a building there. So then they just have I to remove the concrete on the third floor would if you flip down to the third floor plan. Say that again. They would point so, to what? So originally, mm -hmm. I'm just going to move this, the third floor extended over this. And right. so then we had a question. Is that a balcony? Because right. it's enclosed on like three and a half sides. Right. They said it's a permitted obstruction. Don't worry about it. Right. It's allowed. But because they had to deal with the perimeter wall issue, they are setting back the third floor anyway. Right. So that means what's on top of this is now no Not longer building. It's just the terrace. It's it a terrace, down. right? See, now it's a terrace that's extending. On top, but it's on still top, but a it, covered It balcony. covers it. So if DOB then says, no, you can't have that, all they have to do is cut back the terrace a little bit because there's no more going to be a building there. Mm -hmm. It's just the roof. Oh, so it's still cut enclosed it back, on three sides. But then it won't be enclosed on the roof as well. So then it would be more like a traditional balcony. Or, if they cut back that or terrace they could, on the third or they could floor. Just, or they could just punch a hole on this portion that, of that's and, what they and need that to would, do. And that would take care of it too. They you need to eliminate the, the floor area. They just right. all they have to do is punch a hole on this section. On the front. On the front. And that would also address your concern. Right. Uh, either that or and as that I is said easier to do than to remove say the subject to DOB. Yeah. Either or right. okay. I mean so the whole idea of asking the architect to go back to DOB and giving them three months, which is what we did, was to give them 
you know, to the extent that we can do things here, um, to give them a clean sheet to go back with, right? Where, where, where the architect pushes back and says, I don't, I don't want to do that, then we're forced to only, only review the things that are in our purview, call attention, DOB's attention to the things that aren't, and so they don't walk away here from here with a clean sheet. And that, I think, is a mistake. Um, it's like a tactical mistake, given that they've been here for so long. Mm -hmm. And I wish that maybe the architect has, and it just hasn't gotten the results yet. But um, going to DOB with the axonometric, with the arguments, da da da, and finding out what is the approved, or if DOB agrees with the city planning's interpretation that they don't need to do anything about perimeter wall height in the rear, because, you know this is really DOB's domain, then great. Then we go with, and that axonometric um, represents the project, then great. So I think that's part of the problem. So to the extent that there are issues, we're only waiving floor area and the side yard, um, to the side yard vertical extension, right? Um, which now that we talk about it, though, it's a zero lot line building that's being vertically extended, right? Mm -hmm. So there isn't a side yard waiver. Where's the side yard waiver except for that little thing over there, which we can't do? What we talked about. The little side yard waiver where it's an only a three foot side yard on the lot line that has a zero lot line building is not a... <laughs> a straight line extension, either horizontally or vertically, of an existing non-complying side yard condition, unless they can show us that it is. That's Sorry, the problem. Yeah, that's what we were talking about before. I'm still talking about this zero lot line. Mm -hmm. The building is legally a zero lot line building. Right. Knock yourself out, vertically extended. Horizontally extended. They're asking for a different thing. The different thing is doesn't comply with yard reg, side yard regulations. It does, it's, it's creating a new non-compliance. So either that thing is a five foot side yard, if that's what the rule is, or it's a zero lot line. It can't be happen. It can't be in the nether world. Yes. <laughs> so, so that's the problem. And if they were to correct that to either be zero or five, if five is the right number because I'm not sure. Um, yeah, five is thirty. Okay, either zero or five. Then they don't need a waiver from us at all. And the only thing we're talking about is floor area, which means they don't need to get another objection. I think that they're better off just enlarging that section in the back all the way from the first floor um, to the to the third floor. That's a zero lot line extension they would have, and they would be still within the height limits. Okay. Well. Okay. But so the problem is again, that's called construction on a on a built house. So. So the main issue is almost never do we look at legalizing an existing under 73622. Sometimes there are like little rear yard extensions we legalize in the process, but not I, I think also it would houses. be helpful for the applicant to hear from us what we want them to do and, and whether yeah. we should want them to do an option two and or abandon it, just go with option one and, and clarify that issue of the side yard and then uh, whether they proceed to add that section and that would increase the floor area therefore well it would well it would probably bring it down the same thing because they're proposing to eliminate um, the third floor from the right. front so there will be a slight increase in the floor area but as we pointed out in in this neighborhood and their data shows us this building was built all the buildings there have been built before the site was the area was rezoned down Right. to an R41, right. so none of the buildings are complying in terms of their FAR, built height, any of those things. So. I don't think the floor area has been much of an issue. Yeah, the floor area is not an issue, and in terms of the neighborhood context, I, I think I my position is there is no neighborhood context, and I, I, what they have here, if they can sh in, make sure that this building, after the waiver, a waiver of the, uh, that we could grant them through uh, 73622, the building is compliant, I would be okay with it, the bid form. Yeah, yeah, I think we've gotten over that. I, I, what, my comment was simply that I wish the architect had tried, the architect and the lawyer 
had gotten together to try to make the argument in writing, I think that would have been help for, helpful for both us and them, from and for them in particular from a learning perspective. But it's not that we can't put the pieces together to come to our own conclusions. Yeah, I, th okay. I think we've gotten a lot of times these kind of graphics for other 7320, okay. and uh, they've provided all the required drawings that we look for, and in addition to the roofline argument, which in this case was more in particular. Right. So. Um, okay. All right. So more discussion tomorrow about what it is. Okay, but we do have a problem with that side yard. All right, we do. It's really a DOB. Okay. Move on? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Item number 23, 2016, 4262 BZ, 279 Church Street, Manhattan. Um, <laughs> the, um, they're searching for an alternative to installing the fire alarm, and they're discussing it with the fire department. It, you know, this is a yoga studio on the second and third floors of a building that I've been to, and it's a wood frame building. I get why fire department's concerned about it, and it's just that it's very expensive for them. So they're, I hope they're meeting with fire department to see what other kinds of systems are possible. So. Item number 24, 2017, 54 BZ, 1215, 1217 East 28th Street, Brooklyn. Um, I thought their materials clarified um, very well that 50% of the existing exterior walls will be maintained at the exterior and 50% of the floor joists will be maintained. I thought the demolition plans are extremely clear in <coughs> portraying the scope. Um, the scope of the work, I think that's a great improvement using the demo plans. Um, uh, the rear yard incursion was reduced at the second floor to 25 foot 10 inches, and then there is a setback at that same area of one, one quarter of the house is further set back, but they don't provide the dimension. Um, instead, what they do is they say it's seven feet from the garage, but we don't know what that dimension is. They really need to dimension the def difference between the, the, the first setback and the second setback. That has to be a known dimension relative to us, right? Because we don't know the dimension of the garage. Um, and I know that that's how you do it in the field. You just want to hold seven feet, but usually you write seven foot hold, and then you write plus or minus whatever the other dimension is. That way, the contractor knows seven feet's the critical number, okay? Um, the roof height went down a little bit. We asked that it be brought down to align with the neighbors, um, but at this point, it's pretty close to the height of the adjoining one of the houses on the left side, so, so I think it's okay. I just think just putting that dimension in so it's known. Anybody else? Item number 25, 2017, 56 BZ, 1321 Richmond Road, Staten Island. They requested an adjournment until July. Item number 26, 2017, 192 BZ, 5402, 5414, Fort Hamilton Parkway in Brooklyn. They requested an adjournment also. I was wrong. Uh, no, there was a, I think there's an adjournment. We, we, we scheduled it to be adjourned on June 5th, but they want an adjournment from that adjournment. Yes. So we have to figure out what date to put them on. Okay. Okay. Um, new cases, item number one, 2016, 4265 BZ, 25 Bleecker Street, Manhattan. Okay. Um, we have proof of service of initial application to officials and proof of notice of hearing to officials and neighbors. Community Board 2 recommends conditional approval, um, and the applicant really needs to discuss the issues. Um, I won't read them because there's a lot. Um, we have one letter in support. With respect to um, just setting up the issues, the statement of fact states that the non-conforming residential use um, in this existing building lapses upon the demolition of the building. Um, but in fact, there's no requirement to demolish this building to correct those structural flaws. Um, Section 5221 allows structural repairs. 
um, and structural alterations such as beefing up structure to allow for additional floors can be made under 5221 to accommodate a conforming use. So they could actually frame it out so they can add more floors for conforming use. And 52531 allows reconstruction in certain cases. Um, um, but um, Did you see this objection. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, and then you know, and then the other part of the question is um, when I looked up. Well, I maybe I can speak to that after I looked up in Biz, um, and there was actually an application to um, uh, where was it? An application to do structural work in the building. In I'm just looking for my notes, but there is actually an application to do renovation work in the building in 2014, and the work was for structural repairs. So the fact that they didn't do them, I just look at that as neglect, right? Uh, and there isn't any um, DOB condemnation order or anything like that. Um, one question I do have is, um, did the non-conforming residential use, which is on the CFO, um, lapse because it has been the building's been vacant for more than two years. Um, an application, as I said, for renovation work was filed in 2014. So commencing work and reoccupying would have prevented the lapse. So then that's another question of self-created hardship. I I look at, um, and so they're trying to rely. They say they're, that one of their uniquenesses arguments is that the building is obsolete. You can't rely on an obsolete building argument if you're going to demolish the building. It's exactly. vacant lot, right? So um, the uniqueness study states that there are only five lots in the M15B that are as small as this one, yet on the block itself, I counted nine lots that are similarly sized, most of them shallower than this one. And as you proceed north, because this is a really wacky area, as you proceed north, Within the M15B, there are many other really small lots. Um, so the uniqueness chart really needs to be accompanied by a map to show where the studied lots are. Um, but I think that they undercounted on lots. Did you want to jump in? Uh, yeah, I wanted to <coughs> jump in on the uniqueness because it seems to me that the unique, because there are other lots that are just as narrow and just as shallow, it's almost like they felt they had to demolish the building so that they could you know, distinguish themselves from them and saying, yeah, but we're shallow and narrow and we're also vacant. But then that's also self-created, right. you know? So you're demolishing the building to look like you're unique. And then you're claiming it as a uniqueness is an issue. Now, to me, I don't know if it might have been better for them to approach this as we're narrow and um, shallow and we have a structurally defi deficient building on the lot that needs to be enlarged, but then they would have to provide all the background engineering information as to how these are really the uh, structural deficiencies and not deferred maintenance, but it might make sense to go that direction. Yeah. I don't know where they shake out then in that case in a uniqueness study, right. but at least it won't be a self-created issue because yeah. then they could say maybe the structural deficiencies are to such an extent that we have no choice but to demolish the building. Right. So they could go there. We've had cases like that in Brooklyn where yeah. they have been like, you know, small wood residential buildings with not the um, right floor to ceiling height so it wouldn't pass building code and not the right um, minimum widths for habitable rooms and things like that that they could not cure but to demolish the building and then start again. So they might be able to apply that kind of an analysis here. <laughs> And it, this is a federal period building, even though not a land, not a that, not a protected building because it was so heavily modified. But the federal buildings had very low floor to ceiling heights, so especially the top floor where there wasn't even head height. Um, so maybe there is something like that. that it kind of can't compete in the marketplace, or I, I don't know, because I always get nervous about market-based. Right, arguments. but they could say they can't. That they run afoul of the building code, where okay. they there's no way they renovation would be able to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just want to know for the record, we received an objection letter from the president of the 35 35 Bond Street Court who says that the plan, she objects because the plan encroaches on the historic open alley that provides light and air to our building and our neighbor. 
Also, the destruction of a 150-year-old townhouse diminishes one of the few series of federal townhouses in the neighborhood. That's it's right. On an, what, it encroaches on an alley. It encroaches on, an, on the historic open alley that provides light and air to our building, 35 Bond Street, and our neighbors. I don't know. That's her objection. There, okay. Um, and then other comments with respect to the proposed plans, they have to show the actual apartment layouts with doors for bedrooms and so on and label the rooms so that we can look at a comparative value analysis. Um, let's see. Yeah, so I'm just in terms of the DOB permits, I found my notes on that. The application in 2014 was to improve structure, replace the facade, permit was never pulled, and DOP never issued an unsafe building notice. Um, and to the general point of this 45 Bond Street, which is one of the comps that's provided, is a six-story office building on a 25 by 85 lot, so pretty similar to this one. Um, the building is built 65 feet, um, and that building was vertically enlarged by two floors pursuant to 2007 building permits and obtained a CFO in 2013. This is actually, this story is very similar to the project we looked at on 19th Street, 17th Street, where the, so where the building um, two doors down was an existing four-story building to which they added two stories. And we said, why didn't you do the same thing or propose the same thing on your site where you had an existing four-story building that you demolished before you came here? And why didn't you just add two stories? They argued the building could never have handled it, whatever. We, the building didn't exist anymore, so it was impossible for us to verify those claims. Um, yes, yeah, so a warning, do not demolish this building. Um, it's still there. <laughs> yeah, otherwise, go away. <laughs> so um, we also have a recent withdrawal of a variance. Um, that allowed residential use on Bond Street in favor of office use. Oh, this is just to point out to keep it in mind. So we had a variance that was granted fairly recently. I think it was 2015, and we just got a letter withdrawing the mm -hmm. variance, um, saying that they preferred to pursue rather than the um, uh, residential use that the variance permitted office use as a result of, quote, changed residential market. So, um, and I just heard that there's a changed residential market on the, in the news today oh, yeah. in the high end range, which is certainly the Bond Street land because that's where all the movie stars have their apartments. Okay. Um, and this application was filed in no October of 2016 and not prosecuted until a dismissal warning was set in, sent in, um, actually February of this year. Um, so I see that as further evidence of neglect by the owner. It's just been, the building's just been sitting there and not, there's been no movement to actually correct things, which is crazy because it's such a valuable site. Um, with respect to the minimum variance, plans show, um, showing a complying rear yard must be provided. Um, and, and then I didn't find DEP sign-offs of the phase two or the half. Um, but these were submitted only in April, end of April. Okay. Okay. Next. Um, my comments were more with regards to the plan and trying to understand that with regards to what's in the statement. Speak, of speak up louder. Sorry. Okay. Um, so in the statement of fact, the, um, it states that the building will have a first floor and a second floor that will be built to the lot line. However, the drawing does not show that. Drawing shows a cellar that is built to the lot line, but the first floor mm -hmm. uh, is set back, which basically the setback is continued all the way to the maximum height. Mm -hmm. um, so clarity, clarification would be, if that's what they're proposing, which is better than a full lot line building, but mm -hmm. I need to understand what I that think is. I it's a mistake in the statement. But the drawing, yeah. The drawing only shows the drawing shows a full setback. The drawing shows a setback, right. right. So the drawing is correct. The statement of fact is correct. Right. Um, the shadow analysis that was provided to me was not at all clear. What is the um, incremental shadow the building will be creating? Um, 
it, there will be some shadow, especially now with regards to the opposition letter that we have received. It is more important for us to understand how this building will cast a shadow in the rear. Uh, with regards to the uniqueness, I I was okay with it, but I, I look into it more detail. Mm -hmm. This discussion has happened. Mm -hmm. So I have the financial comments, of course, and now it makes sense then why there are some very old sales in here because it's an old case. So for instance, site value based on vacant land to go with the uniqueness finding, but the land sales are ranging from 2011 with the most recent being 2016 and two of the four sales are really old at 2011 2012 if they would update it it would end up raising the site value they might want to update it just so we can get an actual read on what's going on here at this moment in time versus five years ago um for the showroom and retail comparables um, why are there size adjustments downward for larger comps when economies of scale usually state that the larger should be adjusted upwards because larger spaces rent for less money per square foot than smaller spaces and also comps two and five do not appear to be ground floor retail comp two is either and it's hard to tell from the photo it's either up a flight of stairs or down a few steps to an above grade basement and comp five looks like it's a partially below grade floor probably an above ground basement um condominium sales I'm not quite sure. Um, it's actually divided into three comparables for each size, but it's not very clear whether or not it's one bedrooms, three bedrooms, four bedrooms. It's only if you actually look at the, the narrative afterwards that you kind of deduce it's probably one bedrooms, three bedrooms, and four bedrooms. But it's not clear from the actual um, little matrix. And also it's not clear what they're basing their size adjustments on. So it'd be helpful if they would just review it, adjust them if needed, and then just explain it. Um, the three bedroom apartments, or what appears to be for three bedroom apartments, there are two asking prices and only one sale. The two asking prices should not be used because we only use sales comparables. And the one sale is from 2015 and that's very old. The four bedrooms are 2015-2016 sales, which are old, and for some reason there are adjustments down for outdoor space when the subject actually has 430 square feet of outdoor space. So when they actually go to the pricing matrix and they price the apartment, they're adding in for the outdoor space. However, when they're making an adjustment of the comparable, they're actually giving you a lower starting point. So that's like kind of double dipping a deduction. And so that needs to be removed. That's what I have. Thank you. On the financial analysis, I, uh, I noticed that the cost estimate does not satisfy the requirements of the cost estimate that we submitted two weeks ago. I, I they understand, wouldn't know I understand that. that. Yes, yes, I understand that it's an old case. But it, it still needs to satisfy these requirements. This is like a general note. Uh, then I did look at the uh, details of the post estimate, and I would say <clears throat> even the statement of facts mentioned this. These are like two very similar scenarios, development scenarios, from the as of right to the proposed. The only difference here is the use. And, and looking at the cost difference between the two buildings, the as of right building and the proposed building, one of them is about three and a half million, the other one, the cost <coughs> is about four and a half. So we're talking about 25% even more increase. Then I tried to understand why are we getting this such big increase between the two buildings. And I did dive into the, the unit prices that we used. And I noticed that the, for example, the excavation and the foundation, the excavation is kind of very similar between the two buildings. However, the unit price used for Estimating the cost of the excavation for the as of right is $85 per cubic yard. For the proposed, it's $100. So it's, it's again, it's about 25% more. Why I can't find a reason for that? The two excavations are very similar. Similarly, if we look at the excavation support system, same thing. 85 or so for the as of right, for the, uh, for the proposed, it's $100. 
it it should be more or less the same. It shouldn't be that. For the structural steel, the, the structural steel used for the, as of right, was uh, $6,500 per ton. This is really high unit price for structural steel. I, by the way, I, I just checked with, with some of my colleagues uh, last week, some of my friends, about one of the buildings that we were engineering in Brooklyn. It's a six-story building, very similar to that. And I did a check with the structure engineer actually on the actual price for the structural steel per ton. And he told me that it was 3900 after all the change orders that were submitted by the contractor. So he's talking about 6500 almost like 40% or 50% more than what the market goes uh, for. The, the quantity for the structure is 40, 42 tons for the as of right, which by the way, they, according to the use that should be associated with the, as of right, with the as of right, this is kind of a building that will be subject to higher loads than the proposed one, which is a, a residential building. So I anticipated to see more structural steel quantity for the as of right than the proposed. I have seen the opposite. Because the, an office has higher loads? Yeah, usually offices and commercial uses, they have higher life loads. So with higher life loads, you need, you need thicker sections for the steel to frame the same building. So if we're getting 42 tons for the office building, for the residential building, it should be part of that. It shouldn't be high. And, and like I said, for, for the as of right, for the proposed building, even the structure steel unit price is not 6,500, it's 7,500, it's even more expensive. Oh. And, and finally, the foundation, the, the and, and for me, this is, this is kind of an amazing item to, to catch. And I urge that whoever prepared this cost estimate to either consult or read about how foundations are done. He, again, we're going back to the math story, math foundation, and then above this math foundation, we have a slab of grade. This is unprecedented. Nobody does that. If you have a math foundation, you already have concrete floor over the entire building. So you don't need to put slab of grade on top of that, unless you're going to put some dirt on top of the math foundation, and then on top of the dirt, you put slab of grade, and nobody does that. Why because nobody is willing to spend money without need. Right. And, and why are we using that foundation for, for a 60-story building in Manhattan? It, it, it's not clear. So this is just some of my comments, but I hope they uh, will go through the, the entire cost estimate and, and make it like easy to follow per our requirements and then take a look at what we just mentioned in addition to the other items, and I believe we're still like very early in this. Yeah. So. Okay. So they'll get a copy of the admin notice that shows how you put together cost estimate. I sent it out to yeah. a lot of people. You gave it. Okay. Thanks. Should have it. I'll send it again today. Well, they didn't. They they have it, but they didn't update their financials to <coughs> onto it. So that's all. They didn't. It was right. two weeks ago. So I yeah. Think. Yeah. Yeah. Tom. Right. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um. Commissioner Shabetta? No. No other comments? Okay. Okay. Tony? Item number 2, 2016 4275 BZ, 13215 14th Avenue, Queens. So this is the legalization. Um, I find proof of service of initial applications to officials, but I didn't find notice of hearing to officials and neighbors. Um, I thought I. We need that, we need that, we need that. Um, we have okay, hope, hoping we have that. Community board recommended conditional approval 29 to 8. Um, the applicant states in a cover letter submitted on April 30th that the community board's conditions have been complied with. Um, and then, again, unusually, we have um, a letter from Borough President Katz, um, who actually held a hearing on a PCE. Um, unusual. Yeah, then very. She, but she held hearings on the other one too. I was quite surprised to see that. 
Um, but unfortunately, in the PDF I read, I didn't see what the recommendation was. It was cut off on the bottom. So if we could the get the second a clean... page is missing. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. It probably just wasn't. It's probably front and back, and it wasn't scanned. All right. Yeah. Or I'll there's a continuation, and it didn't. I thought I had. I think it was the continuation, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Okay. Um, with respect to the fire alarm system, um, an incorrectly dated letter. So it's dated August 2018. Um, uh, from the applicant was submitted on April 30th of this year, which indicates they are having trouble getting fire department approval for the fire alarm drawings. The applicant should know. Um, the, the, they also state that both fire alarm and sprinkler systems are installed and operational. Um, but so the applicant should know that we now have in place a protocol. Um, and upon the applicant's submission to us of the, of the information that's required by the fire department, BSA can send a letter to them to get things moving on the alarm system drawing review. So we can do that as soon as we get the responses to the questions. Um, I'll send that to them. Mm -hmm. Okay. With respect to ADA access, um, I agree this is very confusing. So there's no elevator connecting the floors. That's the first thing. I see the entrance from 132nd Street to the mezzanine that takes you to the bicycles, rowing machines, treadmills, and one exercise room. But the lockers and conditioning equipment are in the basement. Um, and I have to say, the PDF that I reviewed is really hard to read, so there were places where I was only kind of guessing what the stuff was based on shapes. Um, the, um, it also looks like there's an entrance from the parking lot to the basement, and, and also from the parking lot somehow to the first floor juice bar and sales area. So somehow or other, you can get into the building from all sides. However, how does that, how does that work? if you're a disabled person who always has to work harder than everybody else, right? So I'm a disabled person and I'm at the locker floors and I really want to go to the juice bar. I have to go outside, wheel around the entire block and go back inside to go have a juice. Then I have to wheel outside and go all the way around to the other side to go into the room to go on the rowing machine, okay? So by the time I get to the rowing machine, I need another juice. So. <laughs> so I, I don't understand how that possibly works for the, the way disability access works is you have an, an ADA accessible location and then the reasonable accommodation is that absolutely everything that everyone else can do is available to you on that accessible floor and not that you have to travel with what amounts to like two blocks mm -hmm. because you have to walk outside and, and around the and into the parts. Yes, and it's a and steep slope. I mean, you are the fittest person in your disability because you're working harder than anyone else who goes to that gym. It's just proof of notice. Oh, this is proof of notice? Okay. Maybe great. it didn't get uploaded yet from her. So. Okay, so we have proof of yeah. so notice, right? Yeah, and then there's the, that's the notice letter. Okay. Right? Yeah, and, and then, then we have the, the, oh, shoot. <laughs> Proof of service. Yeah, here's the post office. The cards. Okay, okay. good. Thank okay. you. All right. So we have proof of notice. Um, have. Okay. Um, so, oops. <coughs> have. All right. Just a second. Um, and then I think those were my only comments about the exhausted disabled person. Okay. Anybody else? Those were my comments. Uh, I still was not sure how it addressed uh, the community board concerns of the ADA accessibility, um, given that these floors are at different elevations, access from different entry points, not even the same entry point. Right. Um, so it's a lot of circulation that one would have to get. Though, yes, technically the building is ADA compliant, but not for a user. Right. who is going to use the entire facility unless it can be redesigned in a way where there you have elements of every right. program in every floor and then you don't need to go um, from basement to the mezzanine. But this has a know. circuit. So this has, you know, all different kinds of circuit machines. So if you're working with a trainer who wants to use every one of those circuit machines, then you have to get to the floor with the circuit machines. They are not going to put that all those things okay. on a floor for you. Okay. And then the locker room, and then the juice bar, and all that stuff. I think the locker room is easier. You just put extra lockers in each one of the rooms. No, a locker so. room includes a dressing area, toilet, shower. Right. You have 
Don't they have toilet in the on the first floor? No, you need to have you need to have all the same things: lockers, mm -hmm. showers, okay. men's, women's. Okay. It's not e and and all this so that you don't put in a lift, right? That where maybe arguably it could even be a stair lift. I don't know what DOB allows in terms of that. So, I had a question, which was on the first floor. It shows there is an area indicated for uh, physical therapy space which is accessible only from the first floor of the gym, um, but it is not associated with PCE. So the physical therapy space oh. is located in the rear, and it's accessed from the first floor. Oh. One has to go through the juice bar to the physical. So I'm not sure if it's an independent operation or if it is part of the PCE. And I'm not sure if we have seen application cases where there's a separate PCE with a, separate, with a physical therapy space, and are they sharing certain programs, functions? Yeah. Um, and therefore, do you need a license? Well, is there no egress other than that? No, because, uh, well, there is an egress, but that's just a fire egress from the building. That's kind of, oh. um, but the main entrance is, oops, where did it disappear? <sighs> that's strange that it's not included. Yeah. The, um, the statement of fact states that that, mm -hmm. it's, there is, that it's not part of the PCE. So I would like a clarification on that. I'm not sure what, yeah. I'm not sure what we, if the only access is through the PCE to get to the physical therapy place, if they're doing massages, that's like a way of getting around the whole point of the special permit, which is to prevent massage parlors, right? So then, according to that, you would call it a physical therapy office where you go through the PCE to get to it. That's a way of circumventing the issue. There is one entrance from the first, and, and there is another doorway that leads through a long corridor to But that's 11. not an entrance. That's a fire egress. That's another one that's actually such a joke, right? If it's for people who need physical therapy and they have to travel on crutches, <laughs> like 200 feet through a corridor hmm. that maybe that's part of physical therapy <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay anybody else any other comments on this no, no? okay <laughs> item number three 2017 149 bc 510 quincy street brooklyn we're postponing this application right. they didn't serve notice Item number four, 2017-209 BC, 1622 East 29th Street, Brooklyn. Uh, yes. Um, just a second. We have proof of service of initial application to officials and proof of notice of hearing to officials and neighbors. Community Board 15 recommends approval with 30 in favor, 10 opposed, and one abstention. The applicant needs to discuss the, this divided vote. It's quite an unusual vote for this community board. Um, what? I have it as 30 in favor and 10 opposed. That's what, that's what she said. Oh, that's yeah. right. oh did I, I didn't say hear, you I didn't said. hear the 30. That's why. 30 in favor, 10 opposed, and one abstention. Okay. Which is a no, actually. Um, we have one letter in support, but not on a BSA form, so it's not an indication that notice of hearing was sent. But um, I said we have you proof of, an ish of, of notice, so I must have written that after I found the proof. So let me just. Uh, okay, with respect to the threshold issue of retention of adequate existing exterior walls and joints, joists, I don't see anything in the package that establishes this. Um, both the front and rear walls are being removed. Um, and we can't count illegal construction at the rear um, towards the existing condition, I don't think. Um, uh, they need to provide a demolition drawing as per the sample that we will or have provided, I don't know. Um, with respect to the rear yard condition, uh, um, on the survey it shows two-story structures adjacent that are set back further than 23 feet, um, but they aren't dimensioned, so it's not clear how far back they are set back, because um, the argument there, the statement of facts argues that there are there are adjacent structures in the rear yard, but, this one, but those adjacent buildings are set back further than the 23 feet proposed. 
The FAR study actually doesn't support anywhere near the size of the enlargement proposed for this house for this house typology on 5,000 square foot lots. FAR approaching one is on 20 foot five, 25 foot wide lots, and it's a collection of little attached houses. So this is actually the only really large building in this typology in the area study. Um, the front yard is being significantly reduced on a block with similar house types and deep front yards. And the photo but the photomontage rendering appears to show, in spite of that front yard addition, that it won't alter the essential character. It's either that it's an excellent rendering. That's what renderings are for. Um, so, any other comments? Um, I actually thought this building, um, as proposed, I thought sits very well on the site. Um, the, every one of the building here on this block front has this kind of extension um, in the front, and, and they're all kind of sitting in the middle of the lot. And over time, some have extended into the front, some have been in, into the rear. Uh, what's interesting is this is one of the buildings that still is sitting in the middle of the site. So any extension in the front and the rear, I'm not sure to what extent it is going to meet then, therefore, uh, even if one were to expand this as of right, would then be able to retain um, its exterior wall uh, requirement, because all, most of it will get subsumed uh, as interior walls because of that. Um, I think in this case, give, and there are a couple of other projects that I feel the same way, but the, this one especially is that because the building is sitting so smack in the middle of the site, an enlargement to the front, which would be permitted, and in the rear, which is within the, uh, I mean, even if they were to do it up to the rear yard of 30 feet, it would result in the exterior walls becoming, in some way or the other, part of the interior wall. and. We just need to have much clearer notifications in the plan that in, ensures that these in, these walls will be retained in the uh, uh, in the interior wall. Um, I, mm -hmm. I think otherwise we almost eliminate the possibilities of these buildings enlarging um, because then they cannot do the vertical extension because there's a height limit. Um, the only possibility is within the confines of the front yard and the rear yard and the uh, side yard, it's to extend, with, extend out and that would mean taking away the exterior wall. So I'm very sympathetic on this one to, uh, for the exterior wall to be subsumed into the in, as interior where it needs to be. They've done their best in trying to read in as much of the exterior wall as possible, but in some cases it is converting into interior. So you know how I feel about this one because we because we have had projects where they were subsuming the whole thing and the building sat in the center and the architect at the hearing said there's no way I can do this and then they go away and they come back and they figure out how to do it. There isn't any law that says that you have to extend at the front and in the rear, um, so they can make con modifications to the project to maintain enough of the existing material to qualify. And we've seen in every case that they actually end up doing that. It requires um, the attention of the architect to the rule, and that way we can stay firmly with um, an explanation of what is the 50 percent, what, what we're using to, to be sure that we're retaining an existing building, because once it's on the inside of the building, it's called demolition. Um, and because it's, it's just the reality of how buildings get built and enlarged and so on. So all of this is doable. It's just that you can't work on the same assumptions that you, when you say to your client, no problem, just going to sort of enlarge this everywhere. Um, if you want to do that, then don't come for a special permit. Enlarge it everywhere within the confines of side yards, floor area, all that. Uh, once we have a threshold of retaining an existing building, we have to set a criteria or it's chaos. That's where we were before, in a chaotic state. And it, it's become much easier now. We have demolition drawings. It's much easier to figure out how to give people instruction and have kind of consistent consistency in the responses. So it's all doable. It's just called um, the architect working within the programmatic structure. 
Um, and, and that's what architects do for a living, work within the structure. Okay. Item number five, 2017-304-BZ, 16017 Street, Brooklyn. This is the Brooklyn Prospect Charter School. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have proof of service of initial application to officials and proof of notice of hearing to officials and neighbors. Um, we don't have a community board recommendation yet. Um, no, we do board approved. We do. Yeah. Approved? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We do. Yeah. That was not. Uh, I didn't find it. Okay. Unanimous. Approved. Okay. I was surprised to see you Huh? I was wondering about if that was surprised to see you as approval on a school uh, as of late. I mean, in this district? Um, this is the, um, it's 29 in favor, one opposed, two abstention. Oh, so sorry, not unanimous. Okay, so sorry. Hold, hold on one second. I just want to be clear. Let me just approve 29 in favor, one opposed, two abstention. Thank you. Weird. Okay. Um, with respect to the threshold questions, um, materials were provided to establish that the school meets the 1210 Z zoning resolution 1210 definition of school. And with respect to the site search, a chart was provided using a criteria matrix that I thought was actually quite good. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to understand. I think there's a mistake here. They're showing the second floor being built to the lot line. Um, uh, this is a special permit application, not a variance application. The architect appears to misunderstand section 43-23's 23-foot um, rear yard obstruction rule that limits um, the obstruction to one story excluding basements. Um, unless that first floor is really a basement, because um, there are some ramps, but so far I don't see that as a basement. Um, so I, I, there's an error there or something needs to be corrected. Um, they need to clarify the grade levels on the floor plans. By grade levels, I mean first grade, second grade kind of thing. Um, show refrigerated trash storage area clearly. Currently, it appears to be just dry trash, and we need a refrigerated trash storage area. Um, drawings need to show that the building will be fully sprinklered and equipped with fire alarms. Um, show the required fence include enclosure on the roof for the play areas and the fire department access routes. They're saying it's um, passive play, but no matter what, I think you're, you need to have a fence. <laughs> um, indicate on the plans the closed window condition and the 35 dBA attenuation that's needed to achieve 45 dBA interior as indicated in the EAS. Um, clarify, I need clarification on the ambulance service. Um, are the vehicle that's immediately adjacent and in the same building, are the vehicles basically stored there and the drivers and EMTs report there for work and then are dispatched? Is that how it works? They, I just, they need more on that. Um, and I'm, I do have to admit I'm having some trouble in the interface between the ambulance service and, um, and the school. 320 kids plus 50 staff arrive to this tiny lobby with tight corridors through one set of double doors and no place to gather or to stand in front of the elevator. Um, I don't even know if that meets ADA requirements that's so tight. Um, I'm wondering whether this the project would work better if the school per portion for the first floor didn't set back from the street, but then I don't know that it qualifies as an alternate setback building. So that, that that's part of the thing. So why is it being designed as an alternate setback building is one question. Um, and if they didn't do that, they could split the front um, so that you had the school really distinct from the ambulance service. Um, I also don't understand the purpose of the ambulance services quote, service desk on the roof terrace on the second floor that is shared by the school. I find it pretty odd that they have a shared terrace. Um, this is adjacent to young children, and they're saying, they're, they're saying the ambulance service will only use it after hours, but it's not like you can put a restriction on how somebody uses their terrace. Um, so the statement of um, 
And right. so, and the EAS then considered noise impacts of the roof decks, but assumed the rooftop areas would not be used as play decks. I, again, don't understand how you can go by that assumption, let change your mind, and now it's a play deck. So the, the noise impact needs to be studied. This is actually right behind residential uses. So they're going to need acoustical measures, certainly. I, I agree. I was thinking to myself, there's no way to control children once they're outside. Yeah, exactly. No play. <laughs> Just talking in small groups. Right. Don't raise your voice above a certain right. decibel. This is the teacup holding <laughs> session. <laughs> um, um, they also, I, we do have DOT school safety sign off and DEP on March 14th had a comment letter that requests a phase two work plan in HASP. And it has a, there's a 418 letter, April 8th letter, that had comments on noise and air quality. And a March 23rd letter had comments on, yeah, well, that was the noise. Okay. March 23rd. Also. Okay, responded to DOT and DEP for air quality and their review. Okay. So there isn't anything about air quality yet. So they responded on the air quality. Air quality. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, that's the DOT 323 letter, right, about the metro card and stuff like that. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. Sorry, I didn't read that. Um, all right, any other comments on this? Um, I had the same question with regards to the rear yard, um, the enlargement, the two floors of enlargement in the rear yard. I don't think that's permitted unless, as you said, one of them is a basement. From the sections, it seems like it either has to be up to the height of 23 feet, one story. Um, so uh, I don't think it beats that. The second thing is I wanted the applicant to confirm the setback in the rear. Because it's an irregular rear yard, um, the rear lot line is irregular. Um, I understand the setback, 20-foot uh, setback that is required on the western portion of the building. But it's not clear if the building um, on the eastern side is still meeting that 20-foot uh, rear yard. Uh, I measured it. It seems it is. but I. We should have a footnote in the plan which clearly says that shows that there is a 20 foot setback from where the building uh, uh, lot line starts tapering, uh, angling out. Right. Because it's a step through. Right. It's a step through. Yeah. yeah. And I had uh, some question. Um, I, I think the modal analysis was clear, but the, there was one portion in this in the statement. Uh, something got dropped out, and which was. They need to complete the travel mode uh, yeah. plan for the staff. <laughs> it just kind of dropped off. It, it, well, it said staff would come 19% by car, 43% public transportation, then 38%. Oh. Right, and dropped. <laughs> and dropped. So we just need to know how the 38% come mm -hmm. to the site. I, um, that needs to be filled out. But the rest, in terms of the travel mode analysis, I did not have any questions. OK. Any other comments? Literally have the same thing. 38% okay. by question. <laughs> <laughs> and there shouldn't be any um, lighting or amplified sound right. on the roof or right. the second floor yep. terrace. That's a condition, actually. That's our standard condition when we have rooftop play areas. So. Um, yeah, did anybody else have comments on the school? No? Okay. okay, that's it. This concludes the public review session for May, 15, May 14th, 2018. Yay! Thank you so much. Oh, no problem. <laughs>